Damn, I didn't know we were gonna get this uh, th this hardcore philosophical, but I guess you're this channel. Somebody said on that stream that you did, they 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 said to you, morality is more complicated than internal happiness. To which you said, "quote I disagree. I will wholly argue and stay mad. All of meta ethics is fucking trash." garbage, waste of time. It's philosophers that are bored as fuck, circle jerking against other philosophers that are bored as fuck. All of us have things in life that we want. We try to satisfy those wants. That's all morality is, okay? So everybody who disagrees, suck a dick. Um, however, if four people were to stand in a circle and, and three were to say murder is wrong and the other guy would say, well, I think murder is okay. It feels like there's no possible thing that you could appeal to or look at or ever have a discussion about to resolve that disagreement. I don't know how you would do it. Yeah. I. I, th I think that doesn't work. And okay, tell, tell me why. why. Would you agree with me that there should be a vegan imperative to genocide all cats on the planet? <laughs> Destiny. Destiny, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cosmic, do people call you Cosmic or Alex or what? Pete, I was going to ask you the same thing. Not if people call you Cosmic, but uh, I, I tend to prefer Alex. In fact, I'm considering getting rid of the Cosmic Skeptic moniker altogether. It's kind of a pseudonym that sounds like a game attack that I came up with when I was like 14, which isn't far off what actually happened. So I'm considering shaking it off, but having a bit of a brand identity crisis. So we'll we'll figure that out eventually. Where did, um, um, but, where did Cosmic Skeptic come from? Just early internet edgy philosophy name or what? <laughs> You know what it is? There's this guy and there's no reason why he would have any reason to be watching my videos. But I think years and years ago, we used to, I, I did this thing where we like made music together at some music club or something. And I saw that he'd set up this SoundCloud and his name on SoundCloud used the word cosmic. And I was like, that's a pretty cool word. So when I was trying to come up with a, with a YouTube name, I thought cosmic works. And I was going to go for cosmic critic, um, which sort of makes me internally cringe but then i guess so did cosmic skeptic at the time but there was the whole i don't know it just sounded a bit better and, and to be honest it looks nice written down which is i think a slightly underrated quality of a good youtube name have you seen the thing where the guy it's like a branding guy and he says you know which one of these pictures is kiki and which one is boba have you seen that thing i have not no so he gets like a it's like a picture of some sort of, sort of spiky 2d object mm -hmm. and another one's like this sort of you know this, this rounded blobby object. And he says, which one of these is Kiki and which one is Boba? And the audience immediately identified the spiky one as Kiki and the sort of rounded one as Boba. And he's sort of making this point that people sort of, pe people sort of put things together in a way that you, you might not expect. He asked if lemon, the taste of lemon, is a fast taste or a slow taste. Okay. And everybody unanimously said fast. Yeah. Even though that doesn't really make any sense, there's sort of a, a sense in which you understand what they mean. And I think something about the way that Cosmic Skeptic looked written down and felt, given the nature of the channel, uh, was 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 something something like that. But I, I don't know if the same is true of you. Where did Destiny come from? Uh, just really early on. Um, geez, I must have been, what, probably 14, 15, when I just played games on the internet. I just had like a... When you make your name for battle.net, I chose Neo Destiny because they were just two words that I thought sounded cool. And that was literally it. And now that's kind of my, yeah, my online moniker that I'm a little stuck with. <laughs> but, but they yeah. do sound cool, man. Um, so do people call you Steven or Destiny in these contexts? And which do you prefer? Uh, definitely Steven is what I should be called and definitely Steven is what I prefer, yeah. For sure. Okay, so Destiny, let's jump into things. Wait, what I was Steven. hoping to do. <laughs> you just call me. Oh, all right, okay. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. I'm, 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 I'm messing. Steven, Steven, it is from my now bad. on. I got to turn my, uh, my British sarcasm, whatever humor radar is not on right now. So sorry. Okay, go for it. What I'm hoping to do, Steven, and I'll, I'll emphasize that from my throat, Steven, mm -hmm. is. Uh, something that I think, uh, I've, well, I've had a lot of requests to speak to you in, in various different contexts. Usually oh, people no. want me to talk to you about something sort of vaguely philosophical. Okay. And uh, when I was thinking about what to speak to you about, uh, I, I was told by a friend that you had this entire uh, sort of page on your website dedicated to explaining what your views were on certain things. And there's this whole entry on philosophy. Now, I don't know when you wrote that or how old that is. I also saw that you put out a video a couple of years ago trying to uh, sort of systematically go through what your, your I guess, your ethical uh, worldview is, what your position is on things. And I gave it a listen, and there were a few things that sort of made the eyebrows raise to the, to the back of the head. And I was hoping that what we could do was 
talk about your worldview, your philosophical worldview, your ethical worldview, what it is, uh, sort of how you might justify it. And, and then we can maybe talk about its implications on, on the practicalities of the things you believe as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, so a little bit of a philosophical audit, if you will. Yeah. I guess so. And, and obviously this is going to have implications. I mean, a lot of people want me to talk to you about your, your views that you sometimes express about animals, which I do want to talk about, Mm -hmm. um, because I think I've heard you in the past say that you essentially just don't care about animals in an ethical context. Uh, uh, That might've changed. I might be wrong about that. Is that the case? No, it's pretty close. Yeah. Because we're definitely going to sort of lock horns there. Um, I think that Having listened to what you said, I, I'm trying to understand what you're saying, but I think there might be some ways to push back. But I think in order to do that, we need an idea of what you actually think. So if you were to sort of give uh, an overview for someone who wasn't familiar with you, there might be people listening who who haven't listened to you talk about ethics. What your outlook is here? How do you determine what the right thing to do is when you're going about your ethical conduct? Sure. So on a, um, on a very, very, very fundamental level, uh, I essentially want to create like the best world for me, like a world that kind of maximizes the experience that I have. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of assumptions that I have that kind of go along with this. Um, one assumption is that two people together can create more happiness or utility, whatever you want to call it, um, than two people individually. So if one person on their own can create like 10 units of happiness and another person can create 10 units of happiness, when they come together, they create together like 30 or 40 units of happiness. So some level of collaboration is essential to, I I think, like human flourishing or or human happiness. Um, And then typically whatever whatever system of ethics I have, it kind of only works if other people are on board with the same type of thing. There has to be some level of reciprocation. Uh, So for instance, I can't have like a system that says I'm not going to steal or kill people and then collaborate with people that think they can steal from me or kill me. Um, So whatever ethical system I have has to be universalized to some extent. So whatever rights or privileges I demand for myself, I also have to extend to other people. And I just kind of function in a way that I hope that everybody can kind of share the system and it kind of works for all of us to um, maximize the amount of happiness I guess we can all produce together, essentially. That's like on a a very, very, very fundamental view. That's kind of what's going on. That's what I I try to generate from there. This sounds a bit utilitarian. Is that essentially what you're driving at? Um... Yeah, I guess you, yeah, sure. I guess you can call it that. Yeah. Because what it seems to me like you're doing here is, is extrapolating from something like a, a basic, uh, intuited truth that my well-being or sort of pleasurable experiences, uh, are, are seemingly good for me, uh, and that painful experiences are bad for me. And there's a sense in which I just have this basic desire, this want to maximize my positive experiences. What I'm interested in is how you're extrapolating from that to treatment of other people. Do you think that the well-being of other people only matters insofar as it has an effect on your well-being? I think at a really fundamental level, I think yes. Um, Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Because I've heard, uh, for instance, in this, uh, on this, on this page, you gave the example of some chocolate bars. You said, look, there are sort of five people and five chocolate bars. And, and you might want to say, well, if you're just interested in, in maximizing your own experience, why don't you just eat all five chocolate bars? Mm-hmm. And you said something like, well, that's because if, if I ate them all myself, then these people would be less likely to be my friends. You know, they wouldn't be uh, as, as kind to me. It would actually have a, a negative effect on me in the long run. I just thought to myself, I mean, suppose that they just didn't know that these chocolate bars existed. Suppose that that still they're going to suffer. You know, they're, let's say that this is the only food available. You're on some desert island and you just discover sort of buried in the sand this food and you can eat it all yourself and they're never going to find out. Mm-hmm. Do you think there can be such thing as an ethical obligation to share that food? Or do you think it, it, if, you're, if your world to you is that maximizing your own positive experiences is the right thing to do? then in fact, you might have something like an obligation to not share that food because in, in doing so, you wouldn't be uh, maximizing your own positive experience. Um, I think, I, I guess I would hope that there is, um, I guess I would hope that in whatever society I create, there's going to be some, I guess, some type of virtues that all of us kind of hold to and, and try to do our best to uphold 
irrespective of if we get caught or not. But I don't really know if I expect the average person to do that. So this is why I usually advocate for some level of social dynamics or some level of governmental pressure um, to kind of keep people in line. So, you know, given the opportunity to pay, like if our taxes were hidden and nobody knew if we paid or not, and you had the opportunity to pay your fair share or not pay anything at all, I don't know if I would trust everybody to pay everything. So this is where I would figure that like government would step in and say like, hey, like you have to pay this, like this is your obligation, not to bring up a whole tax debate or whatever. Um, and then same thing with like some types of social norms as well, that hopefully you would enforce some type of social norms that would, in places where people could get away with things that they otherwise wouldn't get caught for, there's gonna be hopefully some sort of social consequence there. But um, I guess I have a hard time. There is an attraction to thinking of a more, um, of some other sort of system that I guess necessitates or requires you to have ethical obligations that have no sort of like um, actual reinforcing mechanism. So, so for instance, like if you found something and you had the opportunity to sneak it or share it, hopefully you'd always share it. I have a thought of a way to, to say like, well, look, because of this reason, you should always be obligated to share it other than kind of these like very broad uh, utilitarian arguments, you know, that like, well, if you were on a lost island and everybody found secret stuff, you know, you you'd probably all be better off sharing than just a couple of people hiding or stealing things. But yeah, I, I don't know really how to like objectively build that out other than starting from a place of personal preferences, I guess, yeah. Well, this is my concern with building an ethical worldview on the basis of personal concern is that mm -hmm. if you say something like, look, I, I just don't have a way of saying that this person should should share this food. I mean, you even said then, well, I would hope that they would share this food. Yeah. But why? I mean, on like, is that a sort of, a, I guess, like a moral hope? Is that sort well, of I the sense in which, you know, I hope that people are good people? I would hope because if I was the person that didn't find the food, I would want some. <laughs> would yeah. Good. So yeah. so this was this was another interesting sort of, uh, rubbing up against each other of two different intuitions, you seem to have this this egoism of saying, you know, what I what I care about here is essentially the maximization of my own uh, well being. Mm -hmm. But then, in situations where it's it's clear that that your positive experience is going to be maximized by doing something that intuitively most people consider to be immoral, we can appeal to something like a different principle, something like a, a Rawlsian veil of ignorance and saying, well, look, if I didn't know who I was going to be in this circumstance, if, if I didn't know if I was going to be the person who gets the food or the person who doesn't, I'd want the food to be shared. And yeah, there's, have fine. you, um, or, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. But, but surely that circumstance, if, if you know what circumstance you're in, if you're not behind a veil of ignorance, if you know that you're the person who's going to benefit to make an appeal to the fact to, to say something like, well, if I were the person who wasn't going to get the food, I'd want them to share fine, but you're not. So what does that matter? I feel like there are so many different, um, uh, there are so many different interactions in life with different things that at some point, like it's very rare that you're going to be on top at, on every single level. Um, so, so you would hope that there are, there are times that you give a little and, and hopefully there are times where other people give a little because it all balances out in the end. But I mean, um, the direct, actually the direct uh, example of this, have you seen the movie? It's a Spanish movie called The Platform, I think. I haven't. Oh, fuck. It's like, it's basically like this moral principle for like an hour and a half where um, it's like a hundred prisoners every month get shuffled on a hundred floor prison. And there's a thing of food that goes from the top to the bottom. I'm sure oh, you've heard I've, of this. I've heard of this. Yeah, It feels like a freshman in uh, high school philosophy or whatever decided to make this film to like illustrate this principle. Um, but yeah, I, I guess um, my, my hope would be that there are so many different transactions in life that like in some sense, like, yeah, you could probably fuck somebody over with no um, consequence at all. But at some point, you're going to be on the receiving end of something, whether it's in old age, um, whether it's if you're down on your luck financially, whether it's you happen to be out in a public area and somebody is trying to kill you or whatever, that like we're all kind of motivated to realize that, you know, if we peel behind that curtain, you know, we might be in the upper position here, but, you know, we might not always be in that upper position. Um, yeah, and yeah. maybe this is why we want some kind of law enforcement to to force people to share in situations where they could keep things for themselves. And this would be something like a taxation system. But, sure. but speaking sort of morally here, mm -hmm. like you could, in theory, at least in some circumstances, just get away with this. That is like, yeah, I'd rather live in a world where if the government were somehow omniscient and knew whenever somebody discovered food and other people were starving, could force them to share it. And in this circumstance you know you're going to get away with it. No one else is going to find this food. You can eat the food right there and then and no one will know that you've eaten it and and nothing is going to come of it. Now, mm -hmm. it, you can say, yeah, but you know, in in uh, you know, 10 minutes time, I might be the person who requires the altruism of other people, but there's no reason for them not to give it to you because they don't know that you've been selfish. They, they, they have no idea. The only thing, in other words, that could 
cause somebody in that specific instance to share the food would be some kind of care or, or uh, concern with the well-being of others for its own sake. It can't be based on a sort of reciprocal notion because in this situation there is no there is no situation in which they even find out that you've stolen the food. You see what I mean? Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, you t- what's your solution? <laughs> and I think I think well, I think it potentially leads to to some quite dangerous implications. Like, like you could imagine somebody listening to this, mm-hmm. resonating with what you're saying, and saying, you know what? That's a that's that's a good point. All I care about is maximizing my own pleasure and saying that um. And, and and that other people only matter in so far as they have an effect on me. And you can imagine somebody who discovers a way to uh, get away with not paying their taxes or discovers a way to exploit other people politically without them realizing that that's what's happening mm-hmm. and just decides to do it because, well, you know, what moral uh, what moral intuition is there to the contrary? And I, I, I just wondered, I, I imagine that if you were speaking in a in a political context and somebody was and, and you were sort of criticizing somebody for acting immorally, and they said, well, look, I just guess I, I never thought I was going to get found out. And you say, but still, that's evil. That's terrible. I can't believe you've done this thing. And they say, well, I mean, to be honest, I was just following your advice and, and trying to maximize my own experience. Mm-hmm. Where did I go wrong? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, like, um, it's something I've thought a lot about, but I, I guess when I, when, I, when I think about these kind of like principles, I just think of, um, I try to think of like, what, how do humans behave? And then what standard of behavior can you realistically hold people to? And mm. I just haven't been able to think of any like objective moral principle that says, you know, well, by this principle, like, I, um, damn, fuck, I didn't know we were gonna get this, uh, th- this hardcore philosophical, but I guess you're, this channel. Um, I- I'm just gonna ask you questions, okay, actually, because if you have a solution for me, then fuck it, that'd be great. I wasted so much time reading this bullshit on meta ethics, basically meta anything in philosophy, I hate all of this, even ethics, even normative ethics, I hate now. But um, I'm curious if you can tell me, what is the value of, um, well, it, let's say you've got two people on an island, right? And you're trying to mm-hmm. enforce like some sort of behavior. What What is the value of being able to say something is right or wrong if the other person disagrees with you? Can you tell me that? What is the What is the value of doing that? Yeah, so you've got a big guy on an island. He could beat you up, take all your stuff, and his life would yeah. be fine. And then you've got a small dude on an island. He can't really do anything. Like what is the value of being able to say like what's right or wrong in that circumstance? I'm curious. Well, the value of being able to do that mm-hmm. is, I think, essentially uh, in line with what you're saying, which is something like self-preservation. It, it's it's similar to sort of the early justifications for government, which is essentially just giving up some of your freedoms in in uh, in return for some kind of security. And I think this is something that slowly happens over the evolution of our species. Now, myself, I'm I I essentially. Uh, conform to a, a view called ethical emotivism, which has gone a little bit out of fashion, uh, I think perhaps unfairly. But I think that uh, ethical expressions are essentially just emotional expressions. But I think about Is this it quite like some form of kind of like ethical non-cognitivism basically? Or? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, it gotcha. is. Um, so moral statements don't actually have truth value at all. There, there is no, it yeah. is, it's not the kind of sentence that can be true or false saying uh, that, that something is bad or expressing a moral discontent with it is a bit like saying murder, boom. no, or, heard, or, yeah. or, or don't, or don't, or even don't do that. Like a, like a command. I think there's a bit more of a prescriptive element. It's not just an expression of boo murder, but also something like don't murder, which equally is something that doesn't have truth value, but there's some kind of normative force to it, but it is essentially an expression. Now mm-hmm. I, I, I would imagine that what's happened here is what, what you've described, which is, uh, thinking, well, if, if we can sort of engender a situation where people generally do share, then when I'm the person who needs to be shared with, I'm going to receive the goods. I think this is essentially what's evolved in human psychology, but it's not a conscious thing in the way that an ethical framework might be. You might mm-hmm. sort of think to yourself, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm gonna share this food because one day I might need the, the food shared back. I think this is something that's happened subconsciously in the way that we evolve lots of behavioral and physical traits that we don't quite know why they're there, but they serve some purpose. And I think the purpose of something like uh, compassion and altruism are ultimately self-serving because the chances yeah. are you are going to get found out every now and again, right? Yeah. But this is purely descriptive. This is sure. just sort of describing why it is that people feel empathetic. And I think you can show that if evolution works at the level of the gene, it seems, let's say, suspicious that our level of altruism and willingness for self-sacrifice seems to map on to how closely genetically we are to the person that we're considering making the sacrifice for. Somebody might be more willing to save their brother or their son than a cousin. 
or a cousin than you know a, a stranger and, and in fact although people are sort of working to 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 ethically step out of this people generally i think have biases towards people who look like themselves they might be more likely to uh donate to a charity that helps people at home rather than abroad for example mm -hmm. and if the reason why this empathetic quali uh, quality has evolved is just essentially for the benefit of the genes it would make sense that this would map on perfectly there's even some interesting thought along the lines of of saying well why is it that somebody would care differently for say like a what is it like a a son versus a brother or a brother rather than a parent, even though you should share the same amount of genes. And they suspect it's because of the fact that a lot of people would have actually been half brothers because of the fact that men were going around impregnating lots of different women in our evolutionary history. So if you had a brother, it was more likely to be sort of a half brother, whereas your son was going to share more of your genes. So like so much about who we care for, why we care for them uh -huh. seems to be dictated by a gene. So I, I think what you're describing there is descriptively what's actually happened, but it's left us essentially with with an inability not to feel a certain level of compassion to other creatures, and that motivates us to share our food, even when we might rationalize that I don't need to share this food, I can't help but feel compassionate to the other members of, of this you know desert island tribe, and so I, I share the food, but that mm -hmm. doesn't confer an obligation to do so. It just sort of describes why I happen to feel like I want to. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, I don't. I guess I don't know if I believe in in real ethical obligations. Then I guess, or if I could like objectively say like someone ought to have some sort of ethical obligation. So when I think of like navigating the world with a system of ethics, I try to think of what maps on the closest to what's going on. What's like the least exploitable by another by like a, a malicious party, um, and then what could be like universalized through everybody, and everybody would kind of work pretty well. So together. So when I think, for instance, of that island example, if I was somebody that um, was of the idea that like I can make absolute moral statements and I could tell this other person like, hey, um, you can't bully me or steal my food or kill me because that would be wrong. Um, and if the other person disagrees with me, then, well, I'm <laughs> I'm in a lot of trouble and my moral statements don't really serve me very well. They don't do anything. They don't help me navigate the world in a, in a positive way. But if I come at it and I assume like, okay, well, this guy is, is coming at this from a self-interested perspective and I'm coming at this from a self-interested perspective. And if, if I can't like, if I can't demonstrate some value or something to this dude or put him in some sort of conundrum, he's probably just going to kill me and take all my stuff. So the actions that would motivate me to do would ensure my safety and survival um, while also, I guess, taking into account his, you know, assuming we both have to survive on this island. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you want to, how would you engage with that? Well, I mean, it, it makes ethics very transactional. Yeah. It, it means that I, I think the problem people are going to have with this view is mm -hmm. that you want to say that the thing that is wrong with me exploiting another human being, the only thing that makes this wrong or in, in any sort of meaningful sense, something that I ought not do, is the fact that sort of maybe this might contribute to a culture in which it comes back to bite me. Yeah. Or maybe this person sort of escapes my exploitation and ends up with the with the whip in their hand and then I'm screwed. Or maybe someone sees me do this and thinks, well, you know, why the hell should I share with this person? Mm -hmm. Can that be the only thing that is wrong with I mean, exploitation, the infliction of suffering? Yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying that it's not, in, it, it doesn't feel very emotionally satisfying. I just, I feel like it maps onto the world in a in a pretty good way. And I feel like, from that perspective, like I could generate government policy or prescriptive statements for people um, that I can expect people to kind of follow through on. Um, be, because I would understand that like the only way to get somebody to follow through on something that they might not necessarily want to do is with some sort of either social or legal enforcement, essentially. So I'm imagining a situation in which your sort of, the, the things that make you tick mm -hmm. are different from other people's. And in fact, we, we can we can sort of talk about the idea I had in mind in a moment, because I remember you were asked on this video that I talked about, uh, somebody I think in, in your chat or whatever asked you, what happens when one person's sort of base internal preferences contradict another person's? Because it's easy enough to say we're going to sort of enter into a transactional relationship where if we share our food, you're going to benefit, I'm going to benefit, you know, it's 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 all good. But if there's a situation in which you have a basic conflict, your interests versus somebody else's interests, what do you do when they contradict? And what you said at the time was a bad preference, I, and I'm, I'm quoting, a bad preference is one that demands other people to violate things that would satisfy their own preferences, in my opinion. There's like an inca incompatibility there. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I have any internal preferences that contradict other people's so radically. Or if they do, I would argue that I'm correct and they're incorrect and fuck them. 
I wonder if that's still the approach that you would take to yeah, basic I think so. Value it, conflicts. It sounds really harsh, but at some point, it's going to become. It, it would. It would just. It would turn into violent conflict, and it would be a destroying one side and, and a survival of the other. So, if there were two civilizations that came into contact, and in one civilization they thought that um, it was permissible, you know, if you really felt like you really wanted to kill somebody, you ought to be able to call someone out on the street, and just kill them. And in another society, they're like, we can't. We're not doing that. Um, this might be such a fundamental disagreement or the um, one civilization of people might be so altered such that this is such a high preference of theirs that they couldn't conceive of living in a world where they weren't allowed to fulfill that. But in that case, when you've got a conflicting, like two deeply conflicting values like that, it would have to come out in, in some sort of violent conflict um, because there'd be no other way to resolve it. Now for would me, there be any, or, ahead. sorry, carry on. I was gonna say, for me, I, I firmly believe that like 99% of humans, uh, just cause we all come from roughly the same genetic stock, I think we have roughly the same fundamental preferences. I don't think there are groups of people that have huge differences like that. Now there might be some that come out through like socializing or cultural stuff. So like maybe people's opinions on like LGBT issues, um, but on really fundamental stuff, like should I be allowed to steal from you, rape you, kill you, um, you know, attack you w without provocation. I think for the most part, I think almost all, every like human being that isn't, that is mentally sound and everything will agree on these things, I think. Uh, I, that that may be true on some sort of very basic assumptions, but I think people often overestimate the moral consensus that that humanity has had throughout its history. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, views about uh, whether you're allowed to sort of kill people, um, I, I think I think have evolved. So, yeah, our, our views on sort of a a nation's right to expand or um, ownership of other human beings in in situations of slavery. I, I don't think it's as obvious as as perhaps you make it out to be. In other words, I think there can be these conflicts, but where there are these conflicts and you say this would have essentially uh, evolve into violent conflict, mm -hmm. do you think there's a sense in which you can say either side is right in that conflict? I mean, imagining, for example, uh, some version of, of World War II where the, the, the fighting was based on some fundamental value conflict about what you're allowed to do to other human beings. Violent conflict. Is there a sense in which we can say that, that one side is correct there? Or do we just have to say that what we're witnessing is might makes right? I feel like to say one side is correct, um, I feel like you would have to be able to ultimately resolve some moral statement down to some truth value. There would have to be some moral mm. facts to speak of. And I don't, I'm kind of cocked. I don't really believe in stuff like that. Um, so I wouldn't be able to say at the end of the day that like, it's right to not want to enslave somebody or it's right to not want to murder somebody. Um, I don't know if I believe that any of those moral statements ultimately reduce to some fact of the matter. So no, I, I don't know if I could ever say there's a right or wrong side in, in any given conflict like that. There's just the values that I purport to have and hopefully other people around me have them. And if some people are so incompatible and we can't find common grounds on it, then at some point it's probably gonna come to, yeah, some, some sort of violent conflict to resolve the difference. So and then through I'm that, actually, what... hold on. There's so many statements I can already see getting clipped of me and fucking shipped out on the internet from stuff like this. So the, on the other, other side of this, the reason why I have an issue with this is because um, I personally have not found a way to resolve uh, fundamental moral differences between two people. The problem being the incommensurality of people's moral systems, right? You know, if some guy says, well, I read all of Kant, and another guy says, well, I read the entire Bible, okay, well, you, you, it's like you've got a guy speaking a binary and a guy based, like there's just no, you're, you're never, ever, ever going to have any sort of, um, any sort of like, reasonable communication between those two people. So I, I think my biggest problem when people try to tell me, well, what about this? Don't you think this is right or this is wrong? When, when you come to people that have these like different moral systems built on what they believe are objectively true statements, because they're because some of those objectively true statements are like axiomatic to them, I don't know how you resolve that difference with somebody else who might have some different, fundamentally different uh, axiomatic statements for, that their moral system is built off of. That's, that's the big problem that I have. So everything kind of becomes a little bit subjective to me. Yeah. Have you tried belief in God? Um, well, I mean, that works for God-fearing people, <laughs> but then as soon as you some who run into somebody who's not, then you kind of, yeah, you have a whole issue there, you know? That might solve, might solve some of your problems, uh, with, with your ability to rightfully assert your own morality. But sure. I guess like you're, you're, you're looking at a situation like World War II and saying, you know, the classic example, the classic sort of, uh, and it is quite an emotive point mm -hmm. against, uh, sort of ethical non-realism is to say, 
how do we interpret this? So, because because you you still, I imagine, meaningfully use terms like good and bad in sort of everyday conversation, or, or like political debates and conversations. You say that this was the wrong thing to do. This was a bad thing. He should have done this. He shouldn't have done that. Mm-hmm. This kind of this kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, all like highly contextual. But then, like, I would also say, like, I'm a I'm a hard line determinist too. But also, like, you need to make a better choice. And it's like, well, how do you believe in choice at all? Okay, well, within the context of what we're talking about, I'm using the word choice, right? But same thing with like good or bad. Like, this is bad behavior. This is good behavior. If somebody would have challenged me, you know, like, oh, well, fundamentally, aren't you a moral subject? I'd probably just shoot him in the face, right? Like, there's there's no meaningful conversation. Yeah, but um, yeah, no, like, we, I, I understand. I definitely know there's a desire to speak of, like, moral absolutes. Like, it feels good. We want to be able to say, like, slavery is morally absolutely wrong or murdering somebody, you know, killing somebody without provocation is absolutely morally wrong. But I don't, yeah, without having, like, a belief in actual reducible moral fact, I don't know how you can make those statements with that level of certainty. Do you believe in the concept of moral progress? Um... Do you think the world is, is better now than it yeah, was no, I understand. 200 the, years ago? Like, I believe in moral progress, I guess, but like, it's a subjective thing. Like, I mean, I'm a, pro- I'm a citizen of the world today. So I believe that, and I like the morals that exist today. So I believe there's probably been like some level of, of progress. Uh, but I, I don't know if I would have been a person a thousand years ago, maybe I would have felt like this was a moral regression, right? Or, yeah. So Yeah, I, in you know. the same way that we can, we can sit here and say, well, you know, there was a time when people sort of hated homosexuals and thought mm-hmm. that women should be confined to the home and how crazy is that look at how much progress we've made mm-hmm. you know in a in a close possible universe with the opposite trajectory we could say or you know if things revert in 100 200 years time we could be sat here saying gosh i mean you know just 100 years ago people thought that women should be in the workplace and that homosexuals should be able to adopt children how crazy and and, and awful that was and look how we've how we've progressed in other words do you think that we have to if 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 we have a worldview similar to yours here, just abandon any ability to say that certain states of affairs are are better and worse rather than just saying, like, I prefer it. I mean, there seems to be a meaningful difference between me saying, I prefer a world in which homosexuals aren't persecuted mm-hmm. versus saying something like, I prefer my showers to be scalding hot rather than just warm. You know what I mean? That there seems to be a, we, we, we seem to be talking about a different kind of preference here. But if it is all just essentially whatever's going to sort of make me feel better about myself, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference between those kinds of preferences, right? Is, is, that, is that your view, that the preference that you have, that, you know, people not be racist, is similar to the preference that you have of what temperature your shower should be? Yeah, I think ultimately at the end of the day, I, I think, yeah, I think I, I think I would say it's all roughly the same thing, yeah. The, and, and then I would have to say in, in considering, yeah, I, I can't technically believe, if somebody were to ask me if you believe in moral progress, I'd have to say no, because progress implies some objective movement from or towards something else, which implies there is some like moral goal or whatever. Um, I, I can only say that like there's been progress insofar as I guess what I would like to see, but ultimately it would all be contextual and subjective. So, yeah. So um, how do you square that with, um, I mean, I, I, I'm not entirely familiar with what, what, sort of you're most interested in right at this moment on a on a political level but i imagine there are certain issues that you care deeply about try to have debates about and and make content about with a view to trying to you know mobilize people into into believing something that, that you believe and saying probably things like this is wrong this is bad this is good this is what you should do how do you square that sort of commonsensical language on the surface level when talking about how to behave with the fact that a, a little bit of digging reveals that what you're essentially talking about is your favorite temperature of shower. I think that the thing that I tried to appeal to is that even if these things are ultimately subjective and even if I can't ground them out in some like resolute concrete morality, um, these preferences are real, they're strong and they're shared by almost everybody. So when I start to argue with people, um, even my rhetorical strategies are gonna be pretty similar. Uh, If I'm arguing trans issues, for instance, with a conservative, I'm not usually going to argue that like, hey, don't you think it'd be good if we allowed, you know, every single type of person in society to have access to the same rights and privileges? Because you're nebulous, negative, positive rights, you're in some weird world. I usually do like a direct appeal to, hey, you're a parent, Uh, If your child had a medical problem and you had a conversation with your child and your doctor, would you want the government getting in between 
you and your doctor in making a good decision for your child, right? So even rhetorically, I try ultimately at the end of the day to appeal to people's like individual preferences and to try to demonstrate like when I'm really, when I'm trying to tell you, when I'm arguing with somebody, and I say, I, I think what you're doing is wrong. Um, that That's the verbiage that comes out. But what I'm really saying and what we'll get at in the conversation is, hey, the thing that you're advocating for I don't think you realize is ultimately contrary to your own self-interests. That's essentially yes. what I end up arguing with people. Yeah, that's more or less the approach that I've taken uh, as well. You're, mm -hmm. you're essentially running a consistency test rather than trying to establish some base moral principles yeah. from which you sort of build, but up, build the, up to truth. The thing I think is important to realize: the only reason why that consistency test works is because we have some shared. I hate, hate that I lean into this so much, but some some shared like moral uh, intuition, right? Um, which is a phrase that I hated three years ago because I was like, we're gonna find the ultimate moral. Blah, blah. But I, but now I now I lean strongly on these moral intuitions. But this system breaks when you if you run into the occasional you know fucking psychopath, right? If you start running into somebody who's like, well, yes. I don't care if somebody tries to kill me, I actually would want to live in a world where we all fight to the death. And it's like, okay, well you're insane, and there is no arguing with you. I can't appeal to your preferences because your preferences are so out of line with you know ninety nine percent of humanity. But um, yeah, that that that's essentially my rhetorical. And I guess like, in which well, case. Yeah. Might makes right. Uh, when you come yeah. up with a with a with a genuine value conflict, it's just whoever's got the bigger guns wins out. And Essentially, that's, that's, yeah. And and that's kind of how it. I don't want to say should be because that's mm -hmm. to import moral language, but it's it's not how it shouldn't be. Yeah, I mean, I, I it's good. I think that's a good thing because ideally, in the um, oh man, if I say like uh, like angular the conservation of angular momentum, does that mean anything to you? Yeah, sure. Okay, like when the when the when galaxies are forming, they have an average spin to them. And, and what happens is, is after millions and mi hundreds of millions of years, all the particles that aren't spinning in a certain way collide. And you get this thing that's like moving in kind of one consistent direction. You're at your angular momentum is on average some direction um, for a, a spinning cloud of stuff. I feel like for humans, that same concept has to apply. That if you had a hundred civilizations and 50 of them were kind of like what I'm saying, where it's like, listen, we're all gonna work together. We're gonna be self-interested. We're gonna do our things. And then you've got like 50 that are like crazy. Some are like, we're gonna kill people that we don't like and blah, blah, blah. Eventually those types of thoughts get weeded out and then you're just left with people that are like, okay, well, we might disagree, but it's in my best interest to respect your rights so that you respect my rights and et cetera, et cetera. Like, I, I think it's okay to not be tolerant of people that are so morally out of line with you that they would be incompatible, you know, with like a free and open society, basically. And to be clear, that's not because you think that they're sort of wrong or corrupt, but just because they disagree with you. Um, that you're, you're therefore justified in uh, sort of asserting your might yeah. and imprisoning or potentially killing them just because they like a different flavor of ice cream to you. Well, hold on. No, when I say we disagree, what I'm talking about is I'm talking about disagreements on fundamental moral preferences, right? So say you've got four sure. religious groups and three religious groups are like, we believe in our God. We think that it's wrong to believe in other gods. Um, but if you worship another God, that's between you, you and whatever, that's for you to figure out. Let's say there's a fourth religious group that says, our God is the only God and we're gonna kill you if you don't believe that. That fourth religious group would have a, fundament, a deeply fundamentally incompatible view of the world as the other three. And I think it would be okay for the other three to be like, well, listen, we can all coexist in harmony with each other, even if we have disagreements and you can't, so you have to go. So the fundamental disagreements I'm talking about are ones related to like basically huge infringements of rights of other people, killing people, raping people, stealing yeah. from people, stuff like that. Yeah. But it would, be, it would be just as okay for that fourth religious group to try to eliminate the other three. Yes. Which... Do you, are you sort of troubled by that implication of your worldview? That if, if, if you have this world religion that just says, you know what, no other God, but God, and we're going to kill anybody who disagrees. And they just start going ahead and doing that. The only recourse you have is not to say you shouldn't do that. It's not to appeal to any kind of moral principle, but just to say, I hope that we've got a better military and, and that's the end of it. Yeah. So, I mean, on a couple levels. So one, yeah, I fully believe that two sides of a conflict could be fully justified in, in, in destroying each other. Uh, this comes up interestingly sometimes in some self-defense things where um, let's say two people are having a conflict and somebody enters a bar and they're trying to figure out, you know, uh, what's going on. And somebody says, oh, John over there is trying to kill everybody, you know, help. 
and John isn't trying to kill everybody. And so a guy that walks in who heard there was a violent conflict sees John trying to kill every, or gets reported to that. He might try to stop John from doing it. John might try to defend himself. And arguably both people have good justification for their actions, which is unsatisfying because you want to say there's one right and one wrong. But I, I think that that's the, um, I think that's the reality of the world. When we say, and then yeah, it, when you use the term like, do you want to appeal to some moral right or wrong? Um, I just don't care too much because I don't know if it matters, mm. right? Like I could be the most morally justified correct person in the world, but if the other guy has the means and capability to destroy me, that those moral statements mean nothing. And and my moral thought will disappear with me as soon as they basically overrun me, you know? Yeah, you said that sometimes uh, both sides in a conflict are justified in, in essentially wiping each other out. Isn't in situations of basic value conflict that always the case? It's always mm-hmm. the case that both sides are equally justified and just completely, when it comes to it, wiping each other out just because they have what is a a fundamental disagreement. Mm -hmm. But when I said, you know, which flavor ice cream, what I mean to say is that it's of the same nature. It might be sort of more fundamental on the sort of hierarchy of their beliefs, but it's got just as much import as saying which flavor of ice cream you you prefer. You just have this preference. Somebody else has a different preference. Yeah, but it would be the difference of the imposition of that value on other people, right? So if you've got a society Mm. where you're saying we can only eat vanilla ice cream, then, you know, maybe people have to die for that. But if you've got a society where you say, I wish we would eat vanilla ice cream, but people are free to eat other flavors of ice cream, right? It's the how much do you impose your values on other people is where you run into these fundamental value conflicts, right? Yeah, I mean, in, yeah. In, in, in that circumstance, you know, you've got one group that says if somebody tries to eat a different flavor of ice cream, we're going to kill you. Yeah. Another group says, well, I don't know if I'm too happy about that. So they get killed. And what's the problem? Well, the well, I mean, the, it depends when you say problem. There is no problem. The people that kill the people obviously accomplish their end. So it's good for them. Now, the people that got killed, it's bad for them. But um, I don't see what the value is in any part of this is of, of appealing to some moral principle. It reminds me of like the comic of like the, there's like a guy that's standing at the gates of heaven and it's a biker and he's holding onto his bike and God's like, well, what happened? And the biker's like, I had the right of way. I don't know. And it's like, doesn't really matter if you have the right of way if the guy ran you over, you know? Um, yeah, I just, I don't see any of the value in appealing to moral principles when it comes to like conflict. Um, yeah. Do you see uh, a danger that this kind of line of thought could lead to some form of social Darwinism? Uh, you know, very, very popularly after uh, the the theory of evolution became accepted science, or I should say by natural selection, mm-hmm. people like to point out that some people take this to say, well, look, we're just animals. We just have different values. We just conflict with each other. Sometimes people are stronger than others, you know, and, and that's just, that's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if, if we decide that we're going to sort of uh, embark on a eugenics campaign to remove disability, and we're going to start by killing everybody who's disabled right now because we believe that, you know, human beings are supposed to be the, the most sort of evolutionarily proficient versions of themselves. That's what we're going to do. This, this line of thought seems to not just sort of lead to that, but justify that line of thought. Yeah, but if you're fighting, if you're fighting back against a group of people that believe that, like, what, what would your... What, you need something more than to just say this is morally wrong, I think, right? And I think even the advertisements, I think intuitively most people would even agree, even if they wouldn't say so, because the advertisements wouldn't just say like, this is wrong, stop. It would probably be showing videos of uh, mentally disabled people with families next to them, of them doing jobs in society. It would be an attempt to appeal, whether you like it or not, to your kind of these like fundamental preferences, right? Like, look, first of all, they look like humans and you are a human, right? You you know, even animals we like because they have human-like features sometimes and we anthropomorphize them. And, you know, you see mentally retarded people, that doesn't mean that they're worthless. It doesn't mean that they don't have value to family and friends. It doesn't mean they can't function in society. Like ultimately, I think the the campaign to argue against the eugenicsers would end up being like an appeal to their preferences, you know, rather than just saying like, this is right or this is wrong. Yeah. And like you said earlier, that relies on the idea that there's some, that, that basically most of the time when we have what seems to be a moral disagreement, there's actually a lower resolution of thought in which we have a shared moral intuition. Use the word moral intuition. Yeah. I would agree exactly that like, and that most, a lot of the disagreements we have, um, so I would almost argue that there is no such thing as moral disagreement among humans, um, and, except for the case of like mental illness, that a lot of the moral disagreements we have end up being like these second or third order thoughts that are more socially influenced. So for instance, like how we feel about like LGBT people, right? Yeah, that it, it's not like a basic 
uh-huh. value conflicts if one person is pro LGBT and one person is not. There's going to be something more fundamental. Yeah, they both of them fundamentally want like what's best for society and wants what's yeah. best for their family. They just think about it a little bit differently, right? Yeah. Or even like you know uh, freedom for human beings when uh, you might have like a religious conception of freedom that means freedom from sin or something. But you, you ultimately want freedom for human beings and the, mm-hmm. the the value is agreed upon. Yeah. But I wonder if there's a circularity lurking in the in the way that you just said. Uh, I think that, you know, everybody shares these moral intuitions most fundamentally, except in the cases of mental illness. Would you be defining cases of mental illness there by their disagreement with the moral principles? I mean, some people might say, for example, everybody agrees that it's wrong to sort of torture babies for fun. And then we say, well, some people disagree with that, but they're mentally ill. And we say, well, what what mental illness do they have? Well, they're, you know, they're psychopaths. Mm -hmm. But the reason that we say they're psychopaths is because they don't share our intuition that torturing babies for fun is is wrong if you see what i'm saying so mm-hmm. you, you can't just say something like well everybody agrees except for people who are mentally ill if you're just defining people who don't agree as mentally ill people you you've well, I mean, the you, same problem that some people don't agree well but I, I mean you could right that's i think you could make that statement no like you but what, like, what, arguably, what grounds do you have do to this, say that they're mentally ill well because they um well i guess it wouldn't be mentally ill maybe you would just redefine this form of mental illness as like, um, I guess like morally incompatible or something with like current society. Um, sure. The, the, the reason why, I guess the reason why I say mentally ill, um, the reason why I say mentally ill is because I feel like fundamentally most humans have this shared agreement on things. And then in order to diverge from this at a fundamental level, you're, you're essentially, it sounds bad to say, but you're like almost like not human in the way that you view things. Like if, if you were to extrapolate some like types of self-destructive or societally destructive behaviors on a fundamental level to everybody else, like humanity would basically, would essentially collapse. For if you had a bunch so of people the, that were like, I want to kill myself, I want to kill everybody around me, I want to rape everybody around me, or like society would necessarily like devolve into absurdity and, and disappear pretty quick, I think, yeah. So they're mentally ill because they're in a minority in terms of their preferences. Um, maybe. Well, I'm not defining all mental illness this way. The only reason why I, I'm, yeah, the only reason why I'm making that carve out for mental illness is because people that are mentally ill um, can have psychotic breaks from reality, so they're not even interpreting reality on some fundamental fundamental level, or they can have like really fundamental parts of their mind that are. Um, are um, like manipulative or just not good for society. So like say somebody that is a psychopath or somebody with extreme narcissism, um, people that 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 plug into society in a very um, exploitative way, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, but but without the without recourse to objective ethics, what you essentially say is that their brains are different. For example, if we took every single narcissist in the world and we said, well, narcissism is a form of mental disorder Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, most human brains work in a particular way, but these people are particularly exploitative and and lack empathy. So they've got this mental disorder and we put them all in a bomb shelter and then we nuke the rest of the world. And the only people who are, who are living is me and you, Stephen, and all of these narcissists, Mm -hmm. guess what? Suddenly we're the ones who are mentally ill because we're in a minority. That seems like a, 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 a bad way to justify our conception of what makes a person mentally sound or mentally ill. We're essentially well, saying it, that whatever the majority is, is, is Yeah, wellness. I mean, is it is it bad? Have you ever read the book or heard of the book, I Am Legend? I've heard of it. Oh, that's essentially the, um, that's essentially the plot of that book. There's a guy that goes around hunting vampires all day um, and then eventually they trick him, they infiltrate his stuff. And then he realizes at the end of the book when they're like bringing him to call for account of his crimes, um, he's in front of it like a civilization of, of these like night dwelling people. And then he realizes like, oh, well, you know, to, to them, I was, or to, to me, they're all monsters, but I guess to them, I am the monster. And it's him coming to that realization at the end. Um, yeah, I mean, what you're saying, <coughs> a lot of the objections that I hear from you, um, and I agree with all of these, is that sometimes a lot of the things that I'm saying are emotionally unsatisfying. Like, I think we want to have a righteous conviction to say, that's wrong, don't do that. Um, and I feel that emotionally, and I mean, even I want that emotionally, but one, I don't see how logically I can ever deduce that. And two, um, I don't see how it even really matters that much. Um, because like you said, say we eliminate the society um, and it's just you, me, and then like 20 of the most intolerant people we know, you know, if, if they come for us with axes and we're like, well, hold on, stop. Like, look at this 42 point syllogism I have to show you why you're actually morally incorrect. Like, they'd be like, okay, well, I don't care. And then they would just kill you. And it's like, oh, well, I guess my, my moral authority here didn't matter much, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I understand that. I mean, to be clear in, in this particular conversation, it's because you said you, you were making essentially a descriptive claim that yeah. 
most people share their basic fundamental values. Mm -hmm. But you said that there's an exception, and again, no no moral element here. But you sure. just said that there is an exception for people who are mentally ill, and mm -hmm. I'm I'm saying. I, I, I guess I'm saying let's be careful not to be circular in saying that we're just going to call anybody who disagrees mentally ill so that we can say, well, everybody agrees except for those who are mentally ill. That would be a bit oh, yeah. like me sort of, you, no, you know I what agree, I mean? Yeah. It, so, like some mentally ill people I disagree with, but not everybody I disagree with would be mentally ill. They're probably going to be very mentally sound people that you still have like very fundamental disagreements with, right? Like in cases of like nationalistic or religious conflict, these people might not be mentally at all, but like second order facts have 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 caused them to take a position against you and the only resolution is through some military conflict yeah. or something, right? Yeah. Although arguably this takes us back to where we started and saying that even the the sort of the nationalist and, and the and the and the globalist and the 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 religious zealot and the atheist, like they, they still ultimately are motivated by something like, you know, maximization of their their own well-being or positive experience or, so, or something like this. Mm -hmm. In which case, we could say that there's some basic moral intuition that most people share. And the reason I wanted to ask you about that was because so much of what we think about the world is based essentially on unprovable intuition. Yeah. For example, the existence of the external world, the existence of other minds. Uh -huh. The are you familiar with the problem of induction, for example? The fact that we we can't we 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 have no reason to say that the laws of physics are not going to stop working in five seconds. Yeah, the time. sun's not necessarily going to come up tomorrow or whatever, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh -huh. and this is a the reason it's called the problem of induction is because it's essentially unsolvable. It might be solvable with theism. That's kind of another discussion, but it, it's not a solvable problem. But we say we can recognize. I have absolutely no way to justify objectively to somebody who disagrees with me mm -hmm. that the external world exists or that the sun will rise tomorrow or that other minds exist, any of this stuff. But yeah. we still believe it, right? I presume you still believe these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so if you're willing to allow unprovable intuitions in the case of general epistemology to, to allow you to say, well, I think it's objectively true that the earth orbits the sun, even though that's based on sort of observations that rest on unprovable intuitions, it's just an intuition that the external world exists and that your sense state is accurate. But you're just going to say, yeah, but I'm just going to trust it and say that because using that intuition, I see that the Earth orbits the sun, I'm going to say it's objectively true that mm -hmm. the Earth orbits the sun. Why can't we just do the same thing for ethics in saying that, yeah, we have this unprovable intuition that sort of my my well-being is good for me or like maximization of positive experience is a good thing. And through that unprovable intuition, I see that murder is wrong. And so I'm just going to say that murder is objectively wrong. It's as wrong. It's as true to say that murder is wrong as it is to say that the earth orbits the sun. If, if you're going to dismiss one uh -huh. because there's no way to sort of resolve the fundamental conflict to someone who disagrees with you, that's true of like all epistemology. Yeah. Okay, so maybe you can uh, <laughs> maybe you can solve this one for me because I've had. Do you know who um, pers perspective philosophy is? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I think he's tried to get me on this argument before, and we have trouble getting much farther either because my mind's not equipped or because I'm just so correct and I don't realize it. Okay, so you may yeah maybe you can help me sort this <laughs> out. So let, first, let me summarize your argument so you can tell me if I understand this correctly. So I'm saying. Well, ultimately, there is no such thing as moral fact. We can't prove that moral fact, so it's silly to pretend like you can make objectively true moral statements. And then you'll okay. say, okay, sure, that might be the case. However, if we look at things like the problem of induction, or if we look at uh, even the manifestation of other minds in the world, you can't prove that any of that exists. However, you don't go through life uh, being like a, like an epistemic agnostic or anti-realist, or you don't go through life assuming that you know tomorrow the, the planet's gonna explode. Like you go through life assuming these things are objectively true. Uh, so why would you grant one for like metaphysics or epistemology, but you wouldn't do the same for ethics? Is that essentially kind of yes. the question? Right? And, and to be clear, it's it's not just I think I think it's a little bit stronger. It's not that it's not just that you you don't go around like acting you know as if these things aren't true. You, you you sort of act as if the external world exists. You act as if other minds are true. That's true, but I think it's stronger that you believe that it's true mm -hmm. that other minds exist as well. Right? It's not just that you act as if that's the case. You you believe Genuinely that I'm a believe. real person talking yeah. to you right now, right? And and that is based upon, let's say, it, it, if I were to run this argument, you mm -hmm. might say that is based on as justifiable an intuition as any moral intuition that you could think of. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll see if you can get me over this hurdle. So my big issue when it comes to things like these, um, there's a lot of stuff we'll argue about, and then it'll boil down to this one point. I feel like it's resolving disagreements between people that point me in a direction of something that 
I'm more comfortable standing on a solid ground on. So, um, uh, so for instance, when it comes to like existence of external universe or something, there are, I can talk to a lot of other people and we can have agreements and disagreements on these things. But ultimately it seems like, like if there are four people standing in a circle and three people are saying, I think that the earth is round. And another guy's saying, I think the earth is flat. We can run a battery of tests. We can take in all the sense data. And eventually our, our, our minds can come to some agreement because of our uh, ability to interact with the external world and say, well, look, actually we are correct, right? And the world is spherical. And the fourth guy, you are just wrong. You can think what you want, but you're wrong. However, if four people were to stand in a circle and, and three were to say murder is wrong. And the other guy would say, well, I think murder is okay. It feels like there's no possible thing that you could appeal to or look at or ever have a discussion about to resolve that disagreement. I don't know how you would do it. Yeah. I I th- I think that doesn't work. Okay, I'll tell, tell you me why. why. I think yeah. because in this in the situation that people disagree about uh something like the shape of the earth or or that the earth exists, let's mm-hmm. say. This might be based upon some fundamental conflict. Let's say that I that I said to you like I don't believe that the moon exists, mm-hmm. right? And you sort of said, but look, I mean can't you see it? Like, can't you, like, haven't you heard, uh, haven't you seen like the photographs? Can't you see it at night? And I, and I, and I say, well, actually, yes, I can, but you're not getting me. What I'm saying is I have a more fundamental skepticism that my sense data is accurate. I think we're living in a simulation or something like that. Okay. If, if we disagree that the moon exists, Mm -hmm. there is no test you can run to disprove that. So long as that's what my belief is based upon. Cause you could say, well, look, let's get a telescope. Let's look in the telescope and I'll look in the telescope and I'll be like, yeah, I see the same thing as you. There it is. There's, there's the moon, there's the sea of tranquility, Mm -hmm. but I still don't believe it's there because more fundamentally, I don't think my sense data is accurate. I don't think there's an external world, right? Mm -hmm. In the same way, if you have moral disagreements, let's say you're pro-gay marriage and someone else's anti-gay marriage, and you say, right, no, we can sort this out. Because look, look at this study that shows that when people are, uh, a society that accepts gay marriage is on the whole happier than one than one that doesn't. Mm-hmm. And look at this, 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 the fact that uh, when people aren't allowed to get married, they fall into depression, the suicide rate goes up. You, know, you could look at all these sort of studies and statistics and things, but that doesn't get you any closer to solving the problem because of course the the fundamental value conflict is one that is uh, is insensitive to uh, empirical inquiry. In the case of the basic epistemic intuitions that make up things like belief in the external world or other minds, they're of the same quality. If you've got four people in a room and they all agree that sense data is accurate, but mm-hmm. one thinks the earth is flat, then yes, based on that fundamental agreement that sense data is accurate, you could draw a consistency test. But if those four people in the room, if one of them doesn't believe that the external world exists at all and believes that they're just a brain in a vat, there is no test you can run. You said there's a battery of tests you can run. There's not one test you could run to disprove that. So, okay. Um, Let me just write this down so I'm keeping track of these. So here, okay. So here are a couple issues. So I think we both agree that at, at, that, if somebody believes in something super crazy that can be resolved with sense data, um, at some point the person will just be wrong and we can safely discard their opinions about the earth being flat or round unless we get at a very, very, very fundamental level about like brain and a vat, correct? That, yeah, at that in, level in basic- way, yeah, so the guy's saying, well, actually, I don't think the moon is wrong. You're like, well, look at all these tests. And the guy's like, well, of course you think that. The matrix is telling you to think that. Like at that point, you've, yeah. So, so here mm-hmm. is a level where... Um, Oof, okay. I'm going to pull out the two most disgusting words ever, okay? Um, have you ever heard of, I'm sure you've heard of the phrase like ultimate skepticism, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I was ha- half concerned it was going to be the N word or something then, but. Oh, that, no, no. It's even worse bad. in philosophy than the N word, okay? Um, because as soon as somebody's pulled this trap card out, you're basically the whole conversation is meaningless. I, I would say that at a very, 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 very fundamental level, that I would say that I am ultimately skeptical. So the strength or the conviction of my statements is only going to be up to a certain point. So if I say, for instance, um, and this is kind of similar to the context we ran into earlier, where it's like, oh, uh, that's a good or that's a bad thing. And you're like, well, you don't really believe that. It's like, well, I guess that's true. When I say good or bad, I mean with respect to the subjective moral system that I have, blah, blah, blah. If we were to say something like the earth is flat or there are other minds that exist, I would say that like all of these statements are also contextually qualified within the realm of, these are the things that I can know to be true, but I'm only going to go like to a certain level of depth with that statement. So if somebody says, well, I'm a brain in a vat, 
Um, what I would say is, oh, okay, I guess you could be, and I could be too, but whatever brain in the vet you are disagrees with whatever brain in the vet me and everybody else is, so that's irrelevant. Like, I would never get to an argument that's like so fundamental that we have to debate whether or not we like actually exist, because that would be a thing where I don't know if I can actually justify that or prove that. I would act as though I do, much the same that I act as though there are things that are right or wrong, but I think ultimately that's gonna rest on like some subjective axiom that I can't like fully truly prove. Unless you've got something yeah, for me, <laughs> that that's that's no problem. Okay, um, but well, I mean, there there might be problems in that, like, if if ultimately you actually like, in fact, did not believe uh, that the external world existed. That's not to say you believe it doesn't, but to say you were actually indifferent or or you you really had no reason to know whether induction was true. Yeah, if you actually believe that, it probably would have an effect on the way that you behave. Um, but but putting that aside, I see what sure. you're saying. But why is it that we're treating these cases differently? Right, because you would still use, if somebody said like, um, do you think that propositions have truth value? Do you think it's possible for a statement like the earth orbits the sun to be true or false? You'd probably say yes. And you'd probably say, actually, I think it is true. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't feel the need to sort of issue a throat clearing that said, well, actually, I'm kind of a, a, an anti-realist about facts. Uh -huh. You would just sort of say, okay, technically, yeah, we could be like massive skeptics about this whole thing. Uh -huh. But nobody really is. Everybody agrees that this is the case. And so it's objectively true that the Earth orbits the sun. Why can't we just treat morality the same? I'm happy for you to say, like, yeah, sure, if we dug down deep enough and started uh -huh. questioning our basic moral intuitions, there's no way for me to prove that. But I'm never going to get into a conversation that goes that deep. Uh -huh. And in, in, in you know, the, the reality of my life, I'm just happy to say, yeah, it's objectively true that murder is wrong. Because it's based on the same kind of intuitions uh -huh. that allow us to escape uh, ultimate skepticism in other contexts as well. Yeah, I guess I just, I feel like the issue is that ultimately there's like, there's zero sense data for morality. Like when we talk about like, um, like even like propositional state, even like prop logic, or even when we talk about math, right? Like I can arguably, I think, or you can tell me if I'm wrong, like I can actually use sense data a little bit for math. Like if I take a mathematical truth, like one plus one equals two, I can actually have one and one things and then put them together and see two. But I feel like there's no sense data anywhere to resolve any sort of moral disagreement. I'm going back to that, yeah. You can tell me for this. Okay, yeah. um, first thing I would say is that I, I think there would probably be some mathematical truths that uh, are insensitive to sense data. For example, minus one minus one is minus two. Um, I don't think there's really, I mean, there might be a way you can sort of map that onto your senses. Um, but I mean, I, I, I feel like I feel like when observe because of how tautologically minuses. like math is built, I think that like most of it. Because if we talk about like negative one plus negative one equals two, like I can have if I have a foundation to understand what two is, I can have a foundation to understand what negative one is because it's taking one less, and then I can imagine negatives as being the flip side. Like the, at the end of the day, like there's going yep. to be some sort of like I can map that on. What is um? What's like the argument against mathematical anti-realist? It's like math has an uncanny ability to line up with reality or something like that. Like I could generate these things, yeah. But but mm. yeah, but I understand that like negative one and negative one. But you can argue it's a little bit harder. But when I say something like murder is wrong, like your mind yes. is blank. There's there's nothing that you can think. Like what does wrongness even look like? You know. But I think what you're 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 doing is you're assuming that the the only kind of evidence, the only kind of let's say experiential evidence that could uh, count in favor of something is something like scientific empirical uh, data. That is the things that you can see and hear, not things that you can feel just as strongly and, and intuitively as you, like in the same way that like when you, when you look at something, it just sort of strikes your eye. You, you don't sort of choose to see the screen that you're looking at right now. It just sort of appears in your brain. In the same way, like if you have a moral intuition about something, you don't sort of choose to feel that, it just strikes you. and there's, there's, I, I guess technically, I guess it strikes a part of the brain. People would poetically describe it as, you know, striking the soul and in the way that the screen strikes the eye. But ultimately what both are doing are just making a bit of your brain sort of go zing and you believe something. In the one case, you know, through your eyes, you know, you, you, you see a computer screen, but what's actually causing the experience is something prods your brain that makes you go, oh, I believe that the screen's there. Mm -hmm. In the same way, you see a, a homeless man getting trodden on on the street and something in your brain just goes, I believe that that's wrong. Yeah, so I guess my question would have to be that like, um, or, or here's a question that I would ask. It feels like if I give you four stimuli, stimuli or stimulus? Stimuluses? Multiple stimulus. Stimu stimuli, I would Stimuli, imagine. four stimuli, okay. If I give you four things to look at, one thing is a blue circle, Another thing is a planet orbiting another planet. And another thing is a car. 
And then another thing is one person hitting somebody else. If I ask you to explain all four things, the first three feel like they're fundamentally in a different category than the fourth one. If I'm starting to get to statements like, this is um, somebody is hurting somebody or somebody's doing something wrong, I guess. Like the descriptions of the descriptive things of reality, like a, like a blue, like a blue circle. Uh, you know, it, it looks blue in my eye and it's got this shape or a tree looks like this or a car ontologically has, you know, four wheels, blah, blah, blah. Versus like, this is a thing that's going on and it's wrong. Like to even be able to say that there's already like a lot of things that are, that are already being processed, you know, in, in a person's mind. Like for instance, if they're wearing oh, yeah. a certain outfit, it might actually be wrong. It's like a sexual fetish now, you know? And, and that's the, the relationship between the things is like, th there's so much more processing there than like what would be like a blue circle or a planet mm -hmm. orbiting something or one and one equals two, I think. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, oh. but I mean, to be clear, it's a different kind of intuition. It would be, I mean, what you're raising, there's a, there's a philosopher called J.L. Mackey who famously raised what he called the queerness objection, that, that if moral properties were to exist in the universe, they'd be so, he uses the word queer, so sort of unimaginably different from everything, everything else we else. interact with in the universe yeah. that I wouldn't even know how to make sense of it. And, and people in response tend to sort of say, well, yeah, but that, that's kind of what ethics is. It is this sui generis you know, uh, totally unique thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there might be some skepticism in saying, well, if it's this totally unique thing, then how can we even really know anything about it? How can we interact with it? Mm -hmm. But as long as you say that most people share a basic moral intuition, you're just grinding the fact that people do interact with it. They do have that experiential phenomena of feeling the, the moral quality. Sure, but I don't no, think uh, I you, technically need descriptively. I don't have to describe that moral quality as anything different than um, than what you said earlier, the shower thing, right? Like people will avoid stepping into a cold shower because it makes them feel bad. People will avoid mm -hmm. socializing with people that hurt others because it makes them feel bad. Like arguably descriptively, I, I think I can generally generate all of these statements without even needing to invoke ethics or morality. I could just do it with the preference okay. thing, right? Yeah. Okay, so so try, try this then. Uh, yeah. Let's say... I want to say that sort of morality is objective and I say that's because, or even like preferences can be objective and I say that's because, you know, when I step into a shower and it's too hot, it hurts. And you mm -hmm. say, well, who cares if it hurts? And I say, well, well, if something hurts, that's bad for me. And you say, well, can't you just, yeah, you know, that could be false, right? Like, and I, and I just say, I, I just can't imagine what it means for something to hurt me without thinking that it's bad. I, it's just intuitively the case that, imagining something harming me is me imagining something bad at the same time. And you sure. say, well, that's just, that's just an intuition. And I'm like, yeah, but my, my brain just sort of does it. I can't help it. Uh -huh. And then I say, okay, so we both see a, we see a guitar sat behind you, a, a, a Fender Stratocaster I'm imagining. Uh -huh. And I say, you know, I think that exists. And you say, I don't think it exists. Um, or, or let's say it's the other way around. You say that that guitar exists. I say it doesn't exist. And you say, but I can, I can see it. It's right there. And I said, okay, yeah, it does exist, but it also doesn't exist. It exists and doesn't exist. So we're both right. Would you be okay with that? Would you just grant that it doesn't exist? Because I'm saying, yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. It does exist. It just also doesn't exist. No, I would probably fight you on that. Why is that? Because I can go and touch it and interact with it. And insofar as anything I've ever thought of as yeah, existing. Uh, of course, exist, yeah, of course you can, because it, because it, it does exist. Uh -huh. Of course you can do that thing. It just also doesn't exist at the same time. Wait, how are like on some like very, very, very fundamental level? Like if you were to say like we're in the matrix and it doesn't exist? Oh, on that level, I could say, okay, that could be true, but I'm agnostic. No, no, I, I mean, it, it literally exists and doesn't exist at the same time. Oh. It's both how? true and false at the same time that it doesn't exist. Wait, how? Or no, or tell me what you mean by that. Right, so, so notice how your brain just goes, no, that mm -hmm. can't be. It's a law, it's what would be described as a law of logic, right? The law of non-contradiction. Can't, yeah. Um, we, we just accept these, these axiological laws, laws like uh, the law of the excluded middle. Something must be true or false. It can't be both. It can't be neither. Propositions, yeah. I mean to say. Law of identity. Uh, law of non-contradiction, non, non law yeah. of identity. What I've just done there is I've just, I've just sort of said to you like, well, sure, I agree with you that the guitar exists, but it also doesn't exist. And you say, well, I can't believe that because of this, because of this, this principle that I have, the law mm -hmm. of non-contradiction. When I say, why, why not? Like, why can't that be the case? You, you, ju your brain just sort of goes. Sure, I would say there are certain it just logical can't properties. Be the case. Yeah, that were literally just granted so strongly, a priori in our brains. But all that essentially is is just this really strong intuition. You know, you can't really explain it. You can't like justify it. You just say, look, dude, like 
Are you telling me you don't feel that? Like, of course, like just pay attention to your brain. Like, of course it can't be true and false well, at the same I time. Would, I and would, I feel like that's something like what's going on with like something, some kind of base moral intuitions. Maybe not quite as strongly. Yeah, but, I, I, like, I, I, there I would, is an analogy that can be drawn here, right? I, I think I would really fight on this. I think I would totally disagree with that. I would argue that um, I think the three I um, hear, oh God, who was, there was a book I read, Bernard somebody? I don't even remember. Um, but like when, when you talk about like non-contradiction, excluded middle law of identity, these are things where there is no room for disagreement on. Nobody can disagree with them. It, it, like arguably your mind is not even human at that point. It's almost unfathomable to think that somebody could disagree on them um, for, for some of these like a priori truths that I think that are granted to our brains by virtue of being human. I would argue that those types of... Um, I don't even know if I would call them intuitions. Maybe that's what we call them, intuitions. I would say that these are far stronger, far different than moral ones, which are um, is as crazy as it is. Like we could, we can bend some of them, right? Like there might be um, in horrible situations, there might be some people that think that rape is okay, or that murder is okay, or that stealing is okay. But you'll never be able to convince somebody out of um, identity or convince somebody of contradiction. Like that's just like unfathomable. So I would argue that these types of intuitions are different. But good. In the same way, you wouldn't be able to convince somebody that their their suffering isn't a bad experience for them. Yeah, I would agree with that. But I think I can describe all of what you just said with preferences. I don't need to invoke morality, right? Like it is a, like the way that the shower hurts you when you get in, like that sensation of pain, you might also get like a sensation of pain when you witness a certain thing that makes you feel a certain way. But I don't think I I guess I was using the word, the word bad there in a moral sense. Like somebody sort of has uh, a feeling that 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 pain is bad for them. It's something that sort of, it, it makes the world a way that it should not be. That that there there's mm-hmm. a there's a way that the world should be that it isn't right now. Um, I guess it's just a question of like, yeah, are those are those technically moral statements or not, or is it like a moral um, ought? Like I ought to get out of the shower because it's too hot for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. You can sort of have descriptive or or like moral descriptivism generally. But I, I guess I guess what I'm what I'm trying to do here is show that uh, even if I mm-hmm. grant you that these intuitions are a lot stronger. And and there are some senses in which some people can deny certain tenets of what are generally accepted as as logical laws. Um, like the law of the excluded middle, uh, something, a proposition has to be true or, or false. It can't be both. It can't be neither. People often ask, like, yeah, take the proposition that the king of France has brown hair. Like, is that true or false? And people say, well, it's it's kind of neither, right? Because there is no referent for the king of France because there is no king of France. And so you want to say it's false, but it doesn't seem quite right to say that it's false that the king of France has brown hair. There seems to be a sense in which that 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 kind of breaks down. Um, also, there are, there are some people who might want to say that there are certain contexts in which you might want to speak of things being true and false at the same time. You might fall into the trap of saying like, oh, it can be true and false at the same time that it's raining because it's raining in one place, but not in another. But the proposition would have to be it's, you know, it's raining at this particular place and it's also not raining at the same time. Mm -hmm. There are like, there are interpretations of logic that say that these aren't actually sort of as hard and fast as people tend to think. Now, what, what what we might say is that yeah, sure, there are people who just sort of deny that logical laws are, are the case. And I, I've met skeptics who, when you push somebody's epistemological nihilism to its core, and you say, well, how do you even know that the laws of logic are the case? They sort of say, well, in fairness, I guess I can't know that. I guess yeah. in, the- in theory, I, I actually can't prove the laws of logic. Fine. We just sort of say, look, I mean, there are people who do that, but that's such a sort of wacky minority view. Like, can we can we just sort of agree that this really strong intuition is, is a good reason to base our epistemology on it? Mm-hmm. Same thing could be true of ethics. Maybe not quite as strongly, but you yeah, might the say only... that there are some basic moral intuitions that, yeah, some people sort of doubt or disagree with, but there's such a minority, such a wacky position that, you know, we can at least build our moral epistemology upon those intuitions. I guess we could, but like at at, at some point, um, at some point I'm probably going to agree with you, but then I feel like, uh, I guess I would argue that I feel like your position has weakened to become mine. I, so like, if you were to say, well, hold on, we have very strong intuitions relating to the three, our, our three like fundamental laws of logic. And I'll go, okay, sure. You know, like, well, can we have like really strong fundamental intuitions about like what's morally right or wrong? At some point I'll say like, you know, in the same way that we prefer things to not be contradictory or to have an identity or to either be true or false. Yeah, we can probably have really strong preferences over like what's right or wrong. But I don't know if that gets us any closer to saying that like morality or moral fact exists, right? Or that like ethics are some real thing. I feel like it's just basically become another way of rephrasing that like, yeah, we all have like certain preferences in life. Like we might have a really strong inclination towards 
identity or non-contradiction, much the same that we probably have a really strong inclination towards things like murder or torture, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the moral fact is there. What it might mean is that we can say something like, yeah, if there is such thing as truth, or mm-hmm. I should say accessible truth, because really this is an epistemological problem rather than a, an ontolo- uh, ontological one, by which I mean we're talking about how how we might sort of come to know moral truths if we can constantly keep questioning our, our assumptions. Mm-hmm. And we could say that like, okay, uh, we can't say that anything is true. And that's the problem of universal skepticism that you can't really ground uh, uh, an epistemological worldview without pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. But I could say that the way I phrased it earlier, me saying that murder is wrong is as true or sort of as objective as uh, the fact that the earth orbits the sun. Maybe gotcha. maybe both of them are ultimately sort of like mm-hmm. based on on totally unknowable intuitions. But in the same way that you're willing to just say in the context of general epistemology, yeah, okay, technically, sure. But come on, man, the earth obviously orbits the sun and that's objectively true. Mm-hmm. Why aren't we willing to do the same thing in the ethical framework of saying, oh, yeah, okay, technically it's based upon an intuition that you can't prove. But come on, man, obviously torturing babies for fun is objectively wrong. Yeah, I guess it, um, I'm trying to think if I have like a psychological hump that I just can't get over. Because the, f- the first thing I want to say is that like we have sense data to, to resolve, because we're looping now, we have sense data to resolve the thing about the earth being um, round or not. But then I think you want to say, okay, well, we kind of have sense data in a way. We, we can sense like morally, moral intuitions of something being right or wrong. No, not quite. What, what I or, mean to say is that like the, the, the sort of earth orbiting the sun thing is based upon the intuition is not that the Earth orbits the sun. The intuition is that your sense data is accurate. Yeah. That's the intuition, right? That, that you just have absolutely no evidence mm-hmm. for or against. I guess I feel like the difference in the two propositions between like the ethical one and, and the, the Earth orbiting, the, 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 the physical one, I guess, is that like, it, 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 this is what it feels like to me. Um, there's a room and behind the door, I have really no idea what's behind the door. And then two people come up and one guy's like, I think that um, I heard a little bit of noise. I think there might be like a person behind the door. And then the other guy's like, okay, well, I think there might be a beluga whale behind the door. And I would look at the guy that says there's a whale behind the door and it's like, probably not. And then he'd say, well, if you think there could be a person behind the door, why not a whale? And it's like, well, I feel like I have a lot more reasons to believe in the person behind the door than the whale. Although I guess theoretically the whale could be there. I guess I feel the same way when we talk about the understanding of these physical and ethical statements. Like physically, I feel like we have so many more reasons to believe there is like universally shared consensus around these kind of like basic logical truths. Um, they're testable in so many different ways with multiple sense data that all coincide with each other. And we can harshly resolve disagreements and almost resolutely say right or wrong, unless you want to be like ultimately skeptical of your own existence about disagreements here. But when it comes to these ethical ah, but statements, that's, yeah, that's it, isn't it? As right. long as you don't have that fundamental disagreement, like the same thing with the, mm-hmm. with the whale and the human behind the door, you're absolutely right that these disagreements can be, can be, can be clinically solved so long as there is a fundamental agreement on something. And in the case of like the, the whale and the human, the agreement is something like we live in a, in a world that obeys physical laws, uh, you know, that, that, that sort of the world that we observe is, is real and, and will resemble the one that's behind the door, you know, so uh-huh. it's unlikely that a, the whale's going to be there. Absolutely. You can resolve that easily. Similarly, in a moral case, if you just grant some kind of assumption, we live in a moral universe where there are moral properties like goodness and badness and suffering is bad and pleasure is good. Uh-huh. Then when it comes to moral disagreements, yeah, you can clinically solve those problems too. But what you're going to want to say as a moral anti-realist is like, well, yeah, of course you can solve these moral problems if you assume some moral baseline, but what's the justification for the moral baseline? And I'm saying, sure, you can easily solve like, is it more likely to be a human or a whale behind the door if you assume that we live in a physical law, a physical world that obeys laws that resemble what they did yesterday? Sure, but what's your justification for believing that? See what I mean? It's, it's like the same question can be asked. And I feel like what you're doing is when you say that descriptive disagreements can be resolved really easily, you're smuggling in uh, agreement upon some fundamental principle that's not justified. Yeah, I And you're not willing to do the same thing. Yeah, then I'm essentially holding a higher standard for the ethical propositions than like the physical ones or whatever. I, and I kind of understand what you're saying there. Um, I guess the, the only thing is that like, and maybe this is just the limitation of my mind. Like I could fathom that one day we'll figure out like what is dark matter or we'll figure out the question of some really challenging thing in physics. 
I can't even imagine. It almost feels like a like a God question, like uh, imagining something's impossible. I can't imagine ever knowing the fact of the matter of is abortion right or wrong, like that. It just feels like uh, something that is just so out of reach. Like almost asking, like, imagine what it was like to be before you were born. And it's like, I, my subjective, I can't, I can't do that. I can't imagine what it's like to not be. I can't be and not be at the same time, right? Um, yeah. And that's what it feels like for like the moral questions. It's just like, I don't even know what, what direction I would even be, begin to step in. Um, and it's so fundamentally different than anything else. Yeah, go ahead. Because you've, you've sort of compared like understanding what dark matter is to uh, like fundamental moral truth. Um it's more like saying, well, yeah, I can't imagine a world in which we sort of suddenly just uncover like the truth about moral intuition. We suddenly are just able to prove that pleasure is good or something. But I also can't imagine a world in which we're able to actually scientifically prove that the external world exists, that we're not living in a simulation. I can't, I can't, I can't believe in a world in which we are suddenly able to prove that induction is true. Mm -hmm. Like I, I can't see that either. Well, that is I, true. I, th the difference is, is maybe there's a difference. You can talk on this. I don't feel like there are any real fundamental disagreements on the presuppositions needed to build out like physics and chemistry. Like nobody's out here seriously saying, um, you know, like um, I, like I don't believe in non-contradiction or I don't believe that like we can measure anything in a laboratory. Whereas for the fundamental, the, the stuff that you need to get morality off the ground, there are massive disagreements. I uh, believe I'm only granted things through special revelation. I, God tells me what's right or wrong, and then someone else might say like, um, "Oh, well, actually, through through reason, uh, you know, every human, a perfectly reasonable, can come to the same moral truths." And there's like, yeah, in physics, I don't see these like fundamental presupposed statements even existing. It's, we all generally come from the same place, I'm, I'm pretty sure. But in ethics, how do you resolve people that are coming from fundamentally completely different places? Like these axiomatic statements, how do you ever figure out like who's right or wrong there? Well, for a start, I think there are people who do. Uh, quarrel with the fundamental axiological assumptions of science. Generally, the scientific community just looks at them with skepticism and amusement and sort of excludes them from the process. But this is kind of like what happens when the the moral, there are people who are skeptical of the basic moral intuitions that most people share. But what happens then is that the moral community looks upon them with skepticism and amusement and essentially excludes them. It's kind of like what you were talking about earlier. You sort of see someone who has a fundamental value conflict and you say, well, mate, you're just not part of our moral community. We're going to throw you in jail. We're going to kill you if we need to. You're just not a part of this. And we almost like sort of laugh at the absurdity of the things that they believe. Similar things can happen in, in a scientific community. It's just because you're, you're unlikely to need to kill somebody or imprison them for this reason. You might have a similar situation in which you have, you know, those those wackos who make those crazy hippie videos about how like nothing exists, man, and science is false and all this kind of stuff. Like there are people who believe that. We just think that they're a, a minority and that intuition is otherwise so widely shared that we essentially just ignore it and, and don't seriously accept the challenge that they're posing to us, which is justify your basic intuitions about your worldview. Yeah, but like for- I think the same thing's happening in both cases. But for science, like if you if you progress to a certain point, at some point, like a paradigm shift will happen, right? Like there are people that'll say like, well, we don't like, we are past Newtonian physics. We're, we've moved on from that because empirically and we validated so much stuff that now we've moved on to the next paradigm. Even if the people that disagreed with it were in a minority initially, eventually they can argue for those positions. But my understanding today, like is Kant any more popular now than he was hundreds of years ago? Or, you know, how many people are still religious and believe in, you know, morality coming from the Bible or the Quran or the Torah? Um, how many, like, yeah, it well, seems like for I as mean, many years you, you as exists, yourself, there's more moral philosophers. Like, how, how much closer are we to convening on like any type of like moral truth? Yeah, God. You said yourself a moment ago that there are certain very basic moral assumptions. I mean, you, in your own words, you said that yeah, people might disagree about like LGBT or like or, or this kind of thing, but the really basic stuff, you know, don't kill people for fun. That that's everybody basically agrees with that all throughout history. Mm -hmm. Like, there just has been a convergence. I think that the majority of moral history, if you look at what moral philosophers are doing. In many cases, they're just sort of trying to justify intuitions or they're trying to explain morality or they're trying to get yeah. to grips with what it is and, and, and definitions and, and meta ethics. But there isn't as much dispute about the kinds of things that are that are right and wrong fundamentally, maybe. I mean, of course, that does exist. Mm -hmm. um, but also, like, yeah, sort of we can say, yeah, we had Newtonian physics. Now we have, you know, Einstein or whatever the trajectory is. But there's a sort of more fundamental assumption that's needed for the scientific method, which is that, yeah, Newtonian physics worked yesterday and it works right now. If I drop this object, it's going to fall to the ground. You just assume that that's still going to be the case in 20 seconds. Uh -huh. I, I assume that like, I'm not just going to start floating and fly into the ceiling or something like that. 
And the point is, I have no way to justify that intuition. Or I have no way to justify that, that belief except intuition. People will want to say, by the way, who are listening to this, well, can't we say that because it's always, for, for all of history, things have fallen to the ground, doesn't that give us reason to think they'll continue falling to the ground? Technically, no, and I don't really have time to get into that now, but that's the problem of induction. And if you, mm-hmm. if you want to know why that's the case, you know, look into the problem of induction. It's, it's, it's fascinating and hugely problematic. But yeah, like, sure, you have scientific progress, but you've got absolutely nowhere closer to guaranteeing that the laws of physics aren't going to change tomorrow. You've got absolutely nowhere closer to proving that the external world exists or that other minds exist or the, or the very things that the, the entire scientific project is, is based upon. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but I, I think that to, now I'm going to appeal to the satisfying or unsatisfying thing. I think that I feel like that's a emotionally not compelling argument that like, well, um, sure, like maybe, you know, we haven't figured out what is a moral fact yet and you feel like we made scientific progress, but tomorrow all the laws of physics might change. It's like, okay, maybe, <laughs> but that doesn't feel, doesn't feel like a very compelling, you know, this might happen, I guess, type of statement. And it kind of doesn't feel that compelling that, oh, well, maybe the Holocaust was just fine. You know, people want to say like, yeah, I guess I, guess I can't like prove that the Holocaust is well, wrong because I'm but I, you a, know a moral what? anti-realist. But I like, would, you know, I, I would argue that I think you could justify that. Um, and here's how I would do it. And I'm not trying to bring up any of your drama or I don't know if you are comfortable talking about vegan things at all. But I think that it is totally possible that in 50 to 100 years, especially depending on the progress we make of lab grown meat, people might look back and go, Holocaust, I don't even know what that was. I'm thinking about the hundreds of millions of animals that were tortured and murdered on a daily basis. And you know, the amount of people killed in any yeah. war for humans pales in comparison to that. But today we are fully on board with like, eating and doing whatever with animals. And so like in the same way that we might say like, I couldn't even imagine uh, thinking the Holocaust wasn't, wasn't, wasn't an okay thing. That was clearly wrong. It's like, well, theoretically a hundred years from now, people might say the same about meat and eat, but you have no feeling about that right now, you know? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think I actually agree with you on that point that people are more capable than they think. I, I, the, the, I guess I'm, I'm appealing to an intuition here of saying like, people are gonna hear you say because uh, what was it you said a second ago when you were like, I'm going to appeal to the emotional thing now? You were like, this is not emotionally satisfying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, it doesn't feel satisfying to say like, well, couldn't all of science change tomorrow? Therefore, right, yeah. Yeah, sure. And and in the same way that that uh, I could just say the same thing to you, which is like, yeah, I understand why people would think that, but I'm willing to say that people are just actually underestimating their, their own sort of uh, ability to think certain things, right? In the uh-huh. same way that we might say, well, people are going to think, oh, I could never see the Holocaust as, as right, but maybe they actually could if they were born in like 1930s Germany and they were raised in the right environment. Actually, they would uh, they would see it that way. Sure. Um, but but look, I, I also sort of, we, we've, I don't want to potentially run in circles or go too much back and, <laughs> yeah, back know, and forth good. on these issues. It's been that's fascinating. That's why meta since, sucks, you know? Fuck it yeah, all, I, had right? another, I had another quote from you, actually, which, I've, <laughs> which I didn't quite get to bring up yet, yeah. which is um, somebody said somebody said on that stream that you did, they, they, they said to you, morality is more complicated than internal happiness, to which you said, quote, I disagree. I will wholly argue and stay mad. All of meta-ethics is fucking trash. Garbage. Waste of time. It's philosophers that are bored as fuck, circle jerking against other philosophers that are bored as fuck. All of us have things in life that we want. We try to satisfy those wants. That's all morality is, okay? So everybody who disagrees, suck a dick. Um, I wonder if some of the the conversational you know, tones that we've been playing uh, today could maybe persuade some people that it's not quite as dire as you make it out to be because we have essentially been doing meta ethics here yeah um, i know but then I, but, my my counter argument to that would be um which i by the way i like waste my time talking about crazy shit it's fun for me or i shouldn't say waste my time that's mean but this has been a fun conversation i enjoy it um <laughs> But the, uh, sometimes I feel like we can spend so much time at a meta level. It's like, did we get any closer to having a, an opinion on like, should we have socialized healthcare or not? How should we deal with homeless people in the United States? Uh, what's like the correct way to deal with a parent that was abusive in our early years? That like on, on the applied level, there are so many fascinating questions. On the normative level, I think there's a lot of interesting that was questions. A, that was a lot of moral terms you just used there for an anti-realist. Sure, true, yeah, well, listen. What's um, the correct thing to do? What should we do? Should we have socialized healthcare? Well, in your view, arguably not. Well, sure. So not this is why this is why the, at not the, the case that we should. At the meta level, I just say, listen, I'm just going to assume we all share these basic like kind of moral truths. We generally want to be happy, healthy, have our families taken care of and be not fucked with. And then boom, then you're done with it. And then you move on. And I feel like it, it, no matter what any kind of like um, ethical philosopher debates, more or less, we're probably going to come out with about the same answers. I would be surprised if there were many 
Uh, if there were many like moral philosophers that would come out with like massively disagreements with me um, on, on like some applied level, basically, that like the way that I get there might be a little bit weird or somebody might say, well, you're using people as a means to an end or, well, you know, I don't like the fact that you can't say that the Holocaust is objectively wrong. Yeah, maybe probably not. These things might not feel that satisfactory. But at the end of the day, when we get to like our applied statements, I have like a, a very Rawlsian view of the world. Um, I think that most of the ethical statements I generate are, are generally pretty positive and I don't have to waste all this time on the meta level to kind of get there. But I understand that that's also, it sounds really dismissive and arrogant of me to say that, which I, it is. <laughs> but yeah. David Hume said of, uh, of, I don't know if he was talking specifically about the problem of induction or the problems of philosophy in general, that you have this, this list of problems like the problem of induction that you study for hours and hours and think, my God, there's no solution to this. We have absolutely no grounding for our epistemic worldview. I have no better reason to think that I'm going to start flying as I'm going to start falling if I jump out of a window. Mm -hmm. But then you close the book, you put it back on the shelf, you leave your study and you just act as if you hadn't done any of that at all, because of course you don't believe you're going to start flying. Mm -hmm. And and there's a sense in which, like even philosophers who do that for a living, will agree with you that okay, it's not going to change how you feel. But the the purpose of this kind of there's constructive and and I guess like destructive philosophy and constructive philosophy might be trying to sort of uh, build up worldviews. But what we're doing here is essentially saying, well, we do believe certain things. Let's try and figure out why we do, whether it's justified and sort of yeah. break it down. And, and that's what we're engaged in here. But it, it won't change the fact that we do believe these certain things. But since you brought it up, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, uh, while I still have you, yeah, what, what do you got against animals, man? Well, they taste really good. Isn't that what meat eaters say? <laughs> That that is what they say, and I don't think any vegan would would ever would ever deny that. I, I mean, I guess on a since we're doing sort of meta ethics, um, regardless of whether or not you're going to be a vegan, mm -hmm. I've heard you say that if essentially if there is such thing as moral consideration or moral worth, it just is something that sort of doesn't apply to non-human animals. Yeah, that basically, I, I feel like you can start from one of two points. You can either say um, I value human sentience. And that's where I begin all of my moral construction from. Or you can just say that like, I value all sentience and that's where vegans typically begin their construction from. I don't think there's necessarily a good argument for one or the other. Um, Cause I, I view these as being very foundational statements and being a little ethical anti-realist means I can pick whatever one makes me feel better. So yeah, I, I just, I don't know. Yeah, that's basically where I'm- And, and, and what, what is it that you happen to value? Um, the, the, the human sentience basically. Human sentience. So, so does that mean, uh, can you just like define human sentience? that the human brain uh, seems to produce some conscious experience that I would call a human conscious experience. But, yeah. Okay. Is that, is that true of all human beings? Pro um, probably not. I could imagine somebody having enough of their brain removed such that they don't have that experience anymore. It's probably possible. Uh, but like, would you still sort of value their sentience insofar as they have it just because they're human beings? Um, no, if they're not having a human conscious experience, probably not. So for instance, I could imagine a person gets into an accident and the majority of their brain is destroyed or removed, but their body is kept 100% alive and healthy. Um, arguably this person would have no moral value other than like okay, what so the family would think, I guess, yeah. So you've got kind of two necessary conditions here. One is sentience, the other is being a human. You sort of need both. In order um, for you to, in order well, for you to I say care. human, I say human sentient, human sentience, essentially. Yeah. So you could say to be a human and to have sentience, I guess, but like a human, like there's a human conscious experience. The, the, the moral qualifiers, I mean, or no, I shouldn't say moral qualifiers, The basically the statements are, is do you have a human conscious experience and do you have the ability to deploy said experience? Those are like the two things I say that give you like, as a, like give you worthy uh, or make you worthy of moral consideration. So somebody that like has their brain destroyed or is dead, for instance, like a human body that might have a full brain, doesn't have the capability to deploy a human conscious experience. So they have no moral consideration. Um, somebody who's sleeping does, you can wake them up. Um, an awake alive person, somebody with mental disability does, but you, you could conceivably peel away enough parts of the brain, I guess, that, yeah, that they uh, wouldn't. Because yeah. you, can, you can have sentience without human beings and you can have human beings without sentience, right? So. I guess what I'm asking is, is it sort of, those are the two boxes you have to fulfill. If you're sentient, but not human, you don't care. If you're human, but not sentient, you don't care. But if you're human and you're sentient, then you've sort of conferred moral value onto this, onto this being. Well, I guess the question is, are you considering, is, is, is sentience, is all sentience the same to you? Like, is that just like a thing? Or I, can, give me a definition for this that we're working Yeah, with. I, I mean, I guess sen by sentience, I mean the ability to experience pleasure and pain or desirable and non-desirable 
states oh, okay. of affairs. Sure. Maybe I should it's say- It's essentially the, the, the ability to have preferences, I suppose, is one way sure. of putting it. Okay, because I view like human sentience, I would view it differently than like the sentience of, of a lot of animals or other things. Uh, but sure, I could mm -hmm. say then to be a human and to deploy a, a sentient experience or conscious experience, yeah, have sentience, yeah. Because the, the problem that I have with your view is that it's sort of like an on-off switch, right? You, you've got like this, this, this care for human beings that extends presumably to political activism, to saying that we should hold other people at gunpoint, take their money to make sure that other people aren't suffering, like very seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, we're taking this very seriously, the suffering of human beings. And even like slightly more menial sufferings, you know, like um, you know, being cold at night, people should be able to warm their homes. And so we should sort of have a, have a welfare blanket for that kind of purpose mm -hmm. you know not not that that's menial but i mean in comparison to something like uh you know being forced into a gas chamber it's 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 not as bad but when it comes to non-human animals particularly farm animals or farmed animals i should say pigs and cows uh it's just like an off switch is it, is it just like there's just nothing or is it sort of like well they have moral worth they just have significantly less or in your view is it is it just like these are sort of inanimate objects that you can do with as you please yeah they're they're basically philosophical zombies to me i guess yeah is that true of of every animal that isn't a human being so like um, chimpanzees I, I could, yeah dolphins. yes yeah i could imagine there might be some animal of different sophistication somewhere in the universe or an undiscovered one on the planet earth but insofar as um, animals on the planet go yeah so wait, so it's about sophistication? Um, or, or something like there could be like other types of animals in the universe that have like a conscious experience, I guess, that is similar enough to like a human being or something. Okay. Um, yeah. The, the reason why I see it as problematic to to have it as sort of a binary on and off rather than something like a, a, a scale of gradation is because all life on Earth exists on a scale of gradation. That is like no species has ever given birth to a new species. So of course, like many animals have died in the history of planet earth, uh -huh. but they all lived at some point. So, you know, your parents were humans, their parents were humans, their parents were humans, their parents were humans. You go back a few hundred thousand years, you've got different, uh, well, this would be sort of pre, pre-human, um, but you know, there'll be different species of humans uh, at first. And then you go back far enough for a couple of hundred thousand years and you're looking at sort of apish creatures that are, are, are more that more resemble something like a, a chimpanzee than they do a, a modern homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. uh, and you go further back and you get to a fish, right? But there's no sort of like distinct boundary here. Every single animal gave birth to the same species. There were just sort of such minor changes that over you know billions of years of evolution, we get human beings. The problem is that in principle, if, you, if you're just going to say, yeah, human sentience, human experience, human beings, they matter, and any other animal does not. And if I were to sort of resurrect the evolutionary chain of human beings back to our sort of common ancestor, uh -huh. um, there has to be a, a point at which you just sort of arbitrarily say the sort of apish hominid on this side of the line I, I do not care, inanimate object, do whatever you want with them. And the, the, ex, the, the sort of identical uh, creature on the other side of the line, human being, sentience, care about, want to sort of hold people at gunpoint to make sure that they don't get cold at night. That to me seems like a, an entirely untenable position. Why is that untenable? Well, I, it's, it's untenable in the sense that I mean, would you accept that for, for a start? Do you think that that's essentially what you would do or are doing? Or would I mean, I'm sure there'd be some. I mean, I'm sure there'd be some haziness in the middle, right? Much that like I'm sure you believe you have a neck and you believe you have a head, but I don't know if you could tell me exactly where one ends or the other begins. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, there's going to be some sort of continuum upon which I'll say like it's probably going to be kind of hazy in here. Um, but but I think roughly, yeah, that's essentially what's going on. Yeah. Mm. Because th this is the weird thing, like like as, as you say. Um, almost sort of. I mean, I mean, you point out to me that yeah, like yeah, of course you're never going to be able to draw the line, but you can't draw draw the line easily with many things. But that's why I think that if your ethical views of sort of what counts is based upon essentially the the qualities of the of the animal, and you have this one animal that has this thing called sort of human sentience, and this other animal over here that that in your view does not, we should be talking about a 
a sliding scale here rather than an on and off switch because of the fact that you could resurrect every evolutionary link between those two animals and there's no point at which the switch just gets turned off you know what i mean and it seems well, very I mean, strange to say that you've got sort of 100 100 100 100 100 and then somewhere in the middle it just suddenly mm -hmm. goes from like 100 down to zero not instantly but like over like maybe a few generations and then you're just right at zero again it seems much more plausible that we should look at this as either going slowly from 100 all the way down to zero at some point over here, pretty much equally, maybe with a slight curve or something. I mean, or to um, say that actually it shouldn't go down to zero altogether. Sure. I mean, I could fight with you. <clears throat> this is a big problem, I think, in physics right now is that people feel like there, uh, there needs to be some grand order or some grand unifying thing um, to unite everything in the universe. And it might be that it's just, there is just no clean way to do it. I don't know if it's a reasonable argument to say like, well, it's unsatisfying, therefore it's impossible that our moral consideration would drop off so suddenly. But like our capacity for breeding does, right? Like we have um, like human, 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 and the, we can't breed with the next closest thing to us at all. Like that goes from 100 to absolute zero instantaneously. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I guess it's unsatisfying, but Mm -hmm. Of course, we're in that. It's easy to do now. We're in that situation now because of the fact that the evolutionary links are dead. They don't exist. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so we can quite easily isolate, you know, uh, human beings and chimpanzees and dolphins. Uh, but I mean, there were a time when there were different human beings simultaneously, different species of human beings simultaneously walking around on planet Earth that I believe at least some of them could, you know, breed with each other. It's not entirely clear. Like, for, for example, you know, let's let's go back to when you have... Neanderthals, you have Homo erectus, uh -huh. you have a, a bunch of different human species all walking around on the planet. Like, uh, are you okay with with factory farming those human beings? Is it specifically Homo sapiens that you that you care about? Is it is it human beings broadly? Is it like I mean, wh wh what is it that you're sort of basing this distinctive on switch for morality upon? Um, yeah, I don't know. Somewhere around human conscious experience. It's not going to be very satisfying. Um, I, I don't know exactly if there were other types of humans that walked the earth. I think it would be pretty difficult to do it. But um, I don't think that a vegan justification of saying like, well, we ought to value all sentience. I mean, I, I feel like that's a, a, about as arbitrary. Um, like why value the sentience of animals over like the existence of nature? Um, like the like why not the grand beautiful structure of a tree versus like the sentient mind of like an animal? Why ought one be valued over another? I feel like fundamentally it's all kind of a bit arbitrary. So potentially but but surely sort of valuing the sentience of a, a, a non-human is much closer to valuing the sentience of a human than it is to valuing something like the existence of nature they're, they're much closer to each other I and mean, so if, if you if ways, you if in, i speak to someone like yeah. you who says well i actually do have this intuition that human beings matter and i say why is that and you say because they have the single human sentience and i say well there's this thing that other animals have that's a bit like that which would be like animal sentience which i think maybe should count too and you say well that's arbitrary because why don't i care about you know nature in the trees i'm like well, well that's that's wildly different to the to the thing that we're talking about i'm saying that there's something that seems very similar to what's going on in the human brain in other human brains. And in fact, again, on an evolutionary trajectory, it wouldn't really make sense to say that the consciousness that evolved in human beings is just of a completely different kind and quality to the consciousness that it evolved in other animals. Like that just sort of doesn't make evolutionary sense. I mean, we can say it doesn't make evolutionary sort of sense, but I mean, occur. like if you look at the progress of humans on, on the planet, it is distinctly unique compared to every other species on earth, right? Nobody's even close to anything. I don't think any, I don't think any other creatures even really have developed language or the capacity for language like humans have. Um, some things can use crude words to describe things, but in terms of like, um, being able to imagine things that are not being able to express a negative. Yes. Yeah. Like these are the ability whole, to abstract is often pointed as, as one yeah. of the distinctly human. And it's not features. even things that like exist in a gradient. It's like, this is, I don't know what it was or how, um, maybe it's the Prometheus alien guys came down or whatever, but like, this is like a switch that flipped for human minds. It, it just doesn't exist at all in any other creature on the planet. Um, again, I guess like I, I can understand it being unsatisfying and I, we can even appeal to intuition to some extent, but then I, I can also appeal to intuition. It's like, well, every single animal on the planet like tortures and eats other animals. Um, and intuitively, I guess like we also kind of torture, maybe not torture, or I guess we could if you argue factor farming, like eating other animals as well. Um, so I guess it's, it's hard to, I feel like you can argue the intuition on, on both ends there that intuitively humans might feel a certain way seeing an animal die where it makes you feel sad, but then intuitively we also, you know, have all the benefits of eating food, um, and meat, especially that makes us feel good and helps us in a, a number of health ways. So I feel like appealing to intuitions there is, is very difficult as well. I mean, if, if I were, if I were to grant you that, um, it, it, it certainly wouldn't justify sort of any treatment of other animals. I mean, you could say, yeah, well, animals sort of predate on each other fine but they don't sort of lock each other into cages and and put them in gas chambers 
that, that would be a very weird and inhuman thing to do. And I don't mean in the moral sense, I mean inhuman in the sense of what human beings naturally do. Also, I mean, the language thing is important. I've heard some evolutionary biologists suggest that it might be the fact that human beings have developed complex language that's allowed us uh -huh. to produce, you know, cities and civilizations. It might actually be the fact that we have language that that could be a plausible contender. But also, like, this, this doesn't seem relevant to me to the question of sentience. This doesn't seem relevant to me to the question of sort of having preferable states of affairs. In other words, if, if like, if I break your arm mm -hmm. and I break the leg of a pig, I don't see any good reason to think that in terms of their crude physical experience, it's somehow worse for you than it is for the pig. Um, Indeed, it might actually be worse. And, and I'm not going to claim that it's worse, but I'll give you some thoughts as to why it might be worse. We accept that other animals are, in many cases, much more sensory-driven creatures than we are. And in fact, the fact that we have uh, evolved a capability for language and rationality means that we don't need to rely so much on our crude physical sensations to help us to survive. So we don't need as strong a sense in which, you know, touching the stove hurts your hand because we can tell each other not to do that, uh -huh. you know, whereas non-human animals don't have that. And so they need to rely more, more strongly. And so, for example... Uh, dogs rely on their sense of smell. And, mm -hmm. and most people accept that dogs experience smell far more acutely and intensely than we're capable of even imagining. And we think that's probably because of the way that they've evolved, they're, they're more reliant upon it. Okay, hawks experience eyesight far more intensely and acutely than we're capable of even imagining because they rely more heavily upon it to navigate the world. Mm -hmm. If we are these sort of hyper-rational agents that have developed language and we can talk to each other, we don't need to rely on our uh, sensations of, of, of pain as much to navigate the world. So who's to say that these animals, when they experience that pain, don't experience that pain in a, in, in a much more acute and intense manner than we're capable of imagining in the same way that they experience smell and eyesight in that sure. way. Now, I, I don't, I don't know that that's the case. Yeah. And, and like I'm but, saying, I would say like, it's possible, but like how, we can bear, we can't even imagine other people's minds. How could we imagine that there's any sort of actual experience going on in the mind of an animal? Like yeah. That? But, but you care about other humans, but mm -hmm. you don't care about the pigs, right? Sure. So in the but same I only way, care about yeah, other yeah. humans because I see that we have the same structure and thus like some conscious experience is obviously arising. I would hope from a similar structure, but for animals whose brains seem to have markedly different capabilities than us. I don't know if I'm to believe, or I'm just supposed to take it on probability that I guess they're probably deploying a similar conscious experience, but I have no reason to really believe that. Well, they have similar enough structures to think that when they exhibit uh, signs that in human beings would indicate experience of severe physical pain, that they're feeling that too, right? Um, I, potentially. I mean... I could say that like insects exhibit similar behavior. Now they don't typically possess all of the different structures of the brain. The, some of them only have like a nervous system and that's it. Um, but yeah, I guess I just, I have a hard time buying the argument that like, well, our brains are kind of similar and I know that we have markedly different capabilities, but we should probably just assume that um, animals ha have some sort of conscious experience that's pretty similar or comparable at least to ours. Um, I just, I'm not sure if I buy into uh, that completely. Would yeah. you say the same thing about like eyesight? Or hearing? Like, do you think that, like, you know, uh, like the eyes of a chimpanzee experience the world, like, radically different, uh, differently to the way that human beings do? Or, I think or, there's like, a... It seems to me that, like, I would imagine that chimpanzee ears probably work in roughly the same way, eyes work in roughly the same way. Maybe they can sort of perceive a slightly uh, varied set of wavelengths or something, but the, the, the physical experience is probably roughly the same. I see no reason mm -hmm. to exclude physical pain from that same comparison. I, I have I have no idea. I, I feel like there's a temptation to say that they must perceive sense data like us in terms of like visuals and in terms of auditory stuff. Um, it's tempting to say that, but I don't know if there's like a compelling rational reason why you ought to accept that. That we just say, well, I mean, it looks similar enough. They, it kind of appears similar. So they have kind of sort of similar brains. So they must have the the similar type of thing. It's, it's not just how they look now, but also mm -hmm. the origin. If, if we look at a sort of natural selection picture of the evolutionary development, and we say, well, we, we sort of have a rough idea of how our eyes evolved and how our ears evolved. You know, we can we can say why they evolved to different sort of uh, environmental um, pressures and this kind of thing. And we can say, yeah, I mean, the, the same thing is true of chimpanzees. I mean, the, the well, sort of the, the, the eye and the ear developed before our split with the chimpanzee. Yeah. Like, like, like well, these well, beings already had eyes mm -hmm. before the split between the modern chimpanzee and the modern human being. So we, we've got good reason to think that they're both basically doing the same thing. Well, yeah, but we're not talking about an eye or an ear. We're talking about sight and sound, right? And those are things that happen w within the mind, right? Regardless of the development of the organ itself.
Um, so to, a, 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 like, again, like, I'm sure we have a similar organ that is perceiving light in a certain way. Not, I shouldn't even say perception of light, that light hits it in a certain way and it has the capability to focus and unfocus on things. But is the experience that it produces in the mind the same? Um, I'm not sure. Are there animals, for instance, that, <clears throat> are there animals that truly create music, for instance? That would be like a big sound thing. Now, I know we've got birds that kind of like sing songs, but like, are they truly mm -hmm. creating like music or is this like a heavily instinctual thing where it produces certain songs because it knows it'll get a mate? Um, like that would be, for instance, a, a um, a thing of like, oh, well, here's like an auditory experience that must be similar to ours. Um, yeah, yeah but I mean, again, yeah, the, there's the evidence that, yeah. it, that may be, again, a product of their inability to produce the music. I mean, you can, that there's been research on this. I mean, you can watch videos on YouTube of animals uh, listening to music. You can go and stand by like a, a, a field of cows and start like playing the trumpet and they'll just sort of converge and come and listen. Now, I have no idea how mm -hmm. they're experiencing that music, but like, when we're talking about the development of physical pain, which seems in almost all uh, in all cases to have evolved as a way of saying, this is dangerous, this is harmful for you, so we're going to give you a negative experience that you would rather not be happening so that the organism avoids that or gets away from it then and avoids it in future. That is why we think pain evolved. That's why we think pain receptors exist and why we think that sort of human beings are capable of having experiences that they'd rather not have. There is no reason to think that the same thing is not true of other animals, especially when we share an evolutionary trajectory. That, that I just don't see a, a tenable way to suggest that other animals that have brains that light up when you do things to them and they react in similar ways and they scream out in pain and they try to run away. And I recognize that, you know, a, a, a plant can grow towards the sun, this kind of thing. But we, we're ticking so many of the boxes here mm -hmm. that I, I think at the, at the, and at the a, very least, yeah. it mm -hmm. shouldn't be on me to prove that animals do feel pain before we say we can do whatever we like to them. I think it should be mm -hmm. on you to prove that they can't before we start doing that. You know well, what but I mean, I mean like that, that's the thing though, is that neither of us can ever prove one or the other. Um, I think it's tempting to say that they must have an experience similar to ours when it comes to pain because of some outward things that we see. But I think that we kind of just like, we, we work backwards and, and we try to rationalize that just because we see a thing that makes us feel a certain way. If I were to talk to you about like two different species and I were to say that they have similar brains evolved from similar things and they can both produce almost identical sounds from their mouths and they have tons of common ancestors or whatever, you would assume these two things could communicate with each other. But like parrots and crows can basically speak, but have like no capacity for language whatsoever. Um, and, and I feel like at the very least that, that, that should be there. If they can produce sounds that are almost identical to human sounds, um, they've got like the ability to enunciate, they've got the similar brains, they're, we're all, are they, or, I don't know if they're mammals or not, probably not mammals, but like we have like similar backgrounds and everything. Like you would expect that, that some kind of language back and forth could happen there, but like they don't even have the capacity to, 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 to abstract thought like that. But we also have a rough mm -hmm. idea of like the parts of our brain that is involved in the, the use of language. Uh, as well as sort of the the process of abstracting, the feeling of pain, all of these kind of things. We have, we have a sort of good picture of which parts of our brain are involved in different kinds of thinking. And we can look at other animals and see if those parts of their brains are present as well. Mm -hmm. And where they are and where they're lighting up in the same kind of way and having the same kind of uh, effect due to the same kind of stimulus. I, I just think, yeah, sure, you can't prove... I understand. Well, real quick, I understand pain, what you're saying there, but it like, seems ludicrous were, to think that they don't. Yeah, I understand what you're saying there, but like, I, you're. I think you're presupposing a lot. Like, if I ask you, like, can you point to me which parts of the brain like produce consciousness? I don't think you can do that. Again, not like like kind of. I mean, you you can sort of you can look at the parts of the brain which and and I I wish I could remember. Um, which parts of the brain I'm talking about here. It's but, largely but associated are... with like prefrontal cortex communication, but there's yes. even questions of like in split brain people, like are there two conscious experiences happening? Or I think there was a man that had a severe case of, I want to say like hydroencephalitis or something. And like 70% of his brain was like water, but he was still like walking around and could talk and communicate with people. And it's like, is he even having a conscious experience or is he an actual living philosophical zombie, you know? Yeah, um, I, I think, and there's there's instances where people's people's brains are damaged in such a way that you can sort of, you can show them an image that they're blind to, that they, they they don't know what they've just seen. They couldn't tell you what they've seen. But if you ask them to draw what, uh -huh. what's in front of them, they can draw it. And it seems like the brain's sort of getting split up and, and there's lots of philosophical questions as to whether there are sort of two persons there. But like, it, it's, it's, I think I have about as much, I, if I have more reason to think that you can feel pain, 
than that a pig can feel pain. I think I only have like the tiniest amount more reason to think sure. that. Oh, okay. And maybe it's got something to do with the fact that you can communicate with me. Maybe it's got the fact, something to do with the fact that you can tell me. But even then, mm-hmm. like, I'm more convinced that you're in pain. I'd be more convinced if you just like clutched your chest and started rolling around on the floor than if you calmly told me that your chest really hurt. I'd, I'd be more convinced that you're feeling pain without the language based on just the way that you behave because I identify that behavior with the way that I behave as well. And given that we share an evolutionary trajectory, given that pain exists in human beings so that we can avoid uh, things that are dangerous and so it gives us a negative experience that we'd rather not be the case, I just don't see a good reason to think that this doesn't apply to other animals as well. And maybe it applies in a lesser sense. Most people, especially either if they're trying to justify our treatment of animals Mm -hmm. or if they're like religious trying to offer theodicy against the problem of animal suffering, they sort of have to believe that it must be different in some way. It must be lesser. But to completely and utterly deny that these animals have any sense of uh, an ability to feel pain at all just sort of doesn't seem right to me. Well, it doesn't seem right to me that I can't eat delicious cheeseburgers. I I understand what you're saying. Um, Listen, we can prepare for a more formal (laughs) vegan debate at some point if you want. But um, yeah, I mean, it's not not so much that I even want to talk to you about about veganism, but just Mm -hmm. like, I mean, we're doing matter ethics. It's like, look, even if animals taste nice and even if you're justified in inflicting suffering upon them to eat to eat their their products, even if that were true, Mm -hmm. to deny that they feel pain at all. I mean, I, I, I know a lot of people who say, yeah, animals feel pain, but animal suffering doesn't really matter or like, you know, whatever. But but to just deny that they feel it at all, I, I think is is such a, a rare position that isn't any longer taken seriously by either like either in the, the, the sphere of moral philosophy or in the sphere of like psychology and neuroscience. I, I just don't think it's a it's a held position. And, and I have a feeling that there's some motivated reasoning going on that the reason why you might be so reluctant to ascribe any kind of, uh, you know, uh, sentient experience to these animals or, or to limit it so, uh, so dramatically is perhaps because, you know, it, 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 it suits uh, how you want to treat them, if you know what I mean. Not then, you know, that sounds very accusatory, but I, but I, I, mm-hmm. I, I feel like that, that's what people are going to probably assume is going on here. Yeah, probably. Um, but I mean, like on the same end, I would look to vegans and I would say that like, I think that you see something cute and cuddly and it produces like the correct facial expressions to feel good about it. And then you produce some motivated reasoning that essentially gives you a reason to like not hurt said cute, cuddly things. Um, I feel like there is no, like, like I, I understand what we're saying. And I, maybe it just sounds like I'm not willing to make what some people would consider like a very reasonable jump that like a human brain and an animal brain aren't that much different. So therefore they ought to be able to deploy a similar conscious experience. Um, but I, I don't know. I just I don't find that compelling to say like, well, look, they're close, so they you know they're basically the same. Um, if you want to say like, well, am I willing to say that animals don't feel pain? I think the the problem with that feeling thing is there's a lot baked into what it means to feel something. Like, is there going to be some sensation of pain that an animal's like nervous system is capable of producing? Uh, you know, to avoid external stimuli or whatever. Yeah, of course, obviously, I would I would assume that. But the, it's not really a question of can it feel pain or not feel pain. I think the question is whether or not the animal's deploying a conscious experience that's having like the sensation of pain through that experience. And I think that's like the question that we kind of get at with veganism um, that's really hard to prove other than to kind of like beg, you know, that like, well, look, like their brains are kind of close to our brains, so their conscious experience should be kind of close to our conscious experience, which I just don't find very compelling. But I, I mean, I understand why, yeah. I, d- I didn't ask this earlier because I it's something that I'm sure you've talked about mm-hmm. sort of myriad times elsewhere, but just just for clarity's sake, I mean, if, if you had a human being with the brain of a pig, would that human being just have absolutely no worth to you? Uh, I think it, essentially so. Chamber? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Cause it would so, be the I same mean, as like a human, like in a coma or a human that isn't, was not deploying a conscious experience at all. But I will say that like a human with a pig brain or something would be different than a human that's like disabled, like a human with down syndrome or a human with autism wouldn't be the same as like a human with a pig brain. Yeah, of course. Uh, but but in the sort of relevant sense of their sentience level, if I sort of isolated the sentience part of the human brain and reduce it to the same level as a pig. So what you essentially have is a human being who, when you prod the human being, the human mm-hmm. being sort of screams in pain and like exhibits all the signs of experience physical pain, but, but they're severely cognitively impaired such that they can't talk to you. They can't communicate their ideas to you. All you know is that they've got this severe impairment but at the same time, when you inflict 
what you think is a painful experience upon them. They scream, they reel, they try to get away. They sort of ish, they, they uh, gesture as if they want you to stop. Their brain is still lighting up in a similar way to non-impaired human beings do this kind of thing. Would you just say, ah, yeah, well, I mean, I know they're exhibiting all those signs, but like, I mean, you can't prove that they're feeling pain and they're so impaired that I'm just going to do literally whatever I want to them because they have zero moral worth at all. I mean, I understand you saying, ah, oh, maybe you'd be, maybe you'd like favor the well-being of other human beings, or maybe it's their, their moral worth would be lowered in your estimation or something. But to say that on these grounds, just nothing, just like a flat line in terms of your moral consideration. I mean, again, like the comparison of like a horse brain and a human or something to impaired human being, I think are two are fundamentally different things. I think an impaired human being is an impaired human being. It's not a dog or a cat or a pig, right? Would you say that like a person with, would you, in your scale of moral consideration, would you consider like a healthy dog to have more consideration than like a human with Down syndrome? Well, I'm, I'm not advocating ethics based on sort of uh, level of human cognitive com com comprehension or something like that. Um, because again, I, I don't think sentience, like a, a dog might be like more intelligent or something like that than a human being with a particular cognitive impairment. But I don't think that they're therefore like more sentient. You know what I mean? Um, sure. Yeah. I don't know if anything can be more or less sentient. I just think there are probably different types of sentient experiences than my guess. Or are you, are you, are, yeah. Like, I don't I think mean, there's like, like the sentience, like the conscious experiences of like a human and a dog and a bat and a bird, like are all probably, my guess would be is that they're all quite different. But I, I mean, I don't know. I'm pretty agnostic towards it. I'm yeah, not sure. To, to, I mean, Thomas Nagel wrote a famous article called uh, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Essentially concluding that that there's there's just no way we could ever even hope to know what it's like to be a bat. Because mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not imagining yourself sort of in, in a bat's shoes, as it were, but imagining yourself as a bat, experiencing the world as a bat. He's like, it's just such an impenetrable area of uh, experience that we, we will just never know what it's like. Mm -hmm. But it seems so radical to me, as I'm sure it will seem to most of the people listening, to say that there is absolutely no moral worth for these other animals, which again, if you were to reconstruct this evolutionary trajectory, you would just have to along some, uh, like somewhere between Homo sapiens <laughs> And like some apish ancestor. So you just sort of have to randomly say like, sorry, buddy. Like imagine you're like God and you're deciding who gets into the afterlife. And you have this rule that human beings get to go to the afterlife. They get compensated for their suffering. All other animals do not. Sure. And you have this like chain of human beings. And, and at some point you have to just say to this guy like, sorry, mate, you're not coming in. And he says, but what is the difference between me and that person on the other side of the gate? And you have to say, nothing there is literally no difference between mm -hmm. you and that person in terms of your abilities but look man i've got to draw the line somewhere and and rather than say okay i'm going to let you in but we're going to slowly start like lowering the stat no 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 it's like off suddenly mm -hmm. it's completely arbitrary as well as being probably completely unjust and unfair in that circumstance as well I, sure. I mean, you say unjust and unfair, which is, I, we're kind of begging the question. I mean, obviously, if you assume that they're just or fair or unjust or unfair based on what we're granting sentience to. But I mean, like, yeah, obviously, I think that, I think my answers are pretty obvious, given that we just came off of like an hour and a half conversation on whether or not I can ever say a thing is like objectively right or wrong. So, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. My, yeah they, I mean, we they, also uh, concluded that you can't say that the Earth orbits the sun, objectively speaking. Uh, true. That, yeah. If you want to be at some foundational level, I will be ultimately skeptic. But I mean, like, if I can't even say, like, human murder is objectively right or wrong, I don't think it's that surprising that I'm not going to enter an opinion on the similarities of animal consciousness and human consciousness to see, to check for, like, rights or wrongs there as well, right? Do you still think it is wrong in some sense to, like, for me to torture another human being, right? Even if it's just, like, subjective or whatever, like, you still think it's, it's like, wrong that I shouldn't do it, that you would vote against me doing so if there was some, like, way that I could ask for your opinion as to whether I do it or not? Yeah, probably. In some utilitarian sense, I'd probably say the same for an animal, too, right? The type of human mind that would torture an animal is probably a very unhuman, unhealthy okay. human mind. There's probably going to be some natural inclination there that, like, I think a normal, healthy human mind likes puppies and likes kitties, and a normal and a human mind that's willing to torture or be... Um, accepting of like extreme like causing animals extreme pain would probably also inflict the same on humans as well right i mean not necessarily especially i mean maybe maybe somebody thought that but now they've listened to this conversation and they've heard what you say and they say oh i can just draw a completely distinctive difference between humans and and every single other animal so yeah i'm, I'm perfectly happy to go and you know torture dogs and vacuum seal cats in a bag but i'm never going to do that to humans because i only care about humans just like just like steven does well, listen, if the idea of torturing animals uh, hurts you and bothers you so much by listening to me, then you should probably become a vegan. <laughs>
Um, I mean, yeah. Like, I mean, that's, I think the, that's... the thing that the, the, the most irritating conversations I'll have are with people that um, seem to express a very emotionally strong uh, reluctance to accept any sort of like animal killing for fun or whatever, but then they all, uh, but then they seem to be willing to eat meat, which I think, I think that position is untenable. Um, right. But I mean, um, yeah, I, I think if listening to me, talk, like I would probably, I don't think I would ever torture a cat or a dog. <laughs> that seems really fucked up. Um, so I mean, if wh listening, why, why, why not? Just because it makes me feel bad. But like, I, okay, but, but earlier you said that the reason that you care about other human like suffering is because it, it makes you feel bad and that like your your moral sense of mistreating other humans is ultimately just based on how it makes you feel. So now you're saying that the same is true of cats and dogs. That you say that, yeah, actually, no, I, I do care about them morally. I, I mean, only insofar as it, you know, yeah, affects my well-being. Yeah, sure, but the ultimate- But like, it is like the same thing here, right? As, as what you were saying earlier about human Yeah, but beings. the difference is that animals are fundamentally different and that the way that they plug into human experiences, there's a lot of ways that we can gain utility out of them that don't involve- like living alongside them and going to work with them every day and treating them like fellow humans, right? So like we can't, we don't eat fellow humans, but you can eat animals. Um, we don't keep humans around as slaves for a variety of reasons, but you can have like a dog or a cat that's essentially like a slave to you for uh, purposes of like entertainment and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I mean, well, like, I, don't know. I, I mean, yeah. if you make those situations the same, often they are actually the same. Like you can imagine a, a human being, a cognitively impaired human being, we often sort of uh, give them like a carer they're not allowed to leave the house on their own they're, they're the carer chooses when they eat when they sleep this kind of thing which is quite similar to sort of having a pet i mean you wouldn't describe it in those terms that'd be quite grotesque yeah. but it's a similar kind of like the justification for saying actually we are going to restrict this person's freedom and we choose when they eat we choose what they do mm -hmm. it like we we do actually do that in the human context as well for extreme levels of impairment i agree but we still treat them as as distinctly and markedly human right um for a variety of reasons. I mean, you can go down very dark paths about eugenics or not treating mentally disabled people in a certain way, but there's a, obviously that's a whole other thing to go down, but. Yeah, I mean, like I like you said a moment ago, you know, if you're upset with torturing animals, you should be vegan. Maybe, maybe that's maybe that's true. Um, it's certainly true that factory farming should be opposed. I mean, somebody might say that like, uh, well, I do care about animal suffering. I don't like torturing animals, but I don't think painlessly killing animals is wrong. And I also am not convinced that like, you know, uh, boycotting animal products is the way to solve the problem or whatever. But but I think you're right that if you are bothered with, you know, the, the torture of animals, you should be against At the least you eating like, factory farming. Yeah, free factory range farming eggs is a bad thing, right? Like sure. factory farming is a bad thing. And, and that's basically what I was, what I would hope that you would agree with um, if, if pressed hard enough that like, it's like uh, Lincoln said of slavery, if this is not wrong, then nothing is wrong. Like if there is this thing called sort of wrongness and badness, it seems that sort of this, this horror show of exploitation, mutilation, gas chambering of animals must be wrong. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm sort of surprised with, with how, how carefully we can have this really long discussion about ethics and, and sort of so uh, conscious of implications of different worldviews and, and, and talking with such sort of nuance and specificity to hear you sort of so, so be so blasé about the suffering of animals. Like it, it just doesn't matter at all. And, and I mean, based on what is essentially an arbitrary like line in the sand between Homo sapiens and every single other human being that exists on the planet, I, I, it just kind of, I, I, I'm quite astonished by it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess what I said earlier, I think there were like three reasons why I gave for my moral system. It was like, um, I believe that humans working in concert with each other produce more happiness than when they work separately. This doesn't apply to animals in the same way at all. We don't work or live alongside like horses and lions and tigers and pigs and cows. Um, for the protection of my own preferences, um, I have to live in a certain way with other humans. This doesn't apply to animals at all. Obviously, we can farm them, we can eat them. They live in separate spaces. They, they don't adhere to any of our things. And then for universalization, I would hope that almost every other group of humans can reciprocate said values to me. Animals aren't capable of doing this either. They don't have even concepts of moral systems or ethical systems. None of the reasons that I gave earlier for all of the careful, um, for, for all the carefulness that I have when it comes to dealing with other groups of humans, none of those things apply to animals. Um, I also I have a really hard time applying a gradient scale to animals. It seems weird to me um, to say that like it's probably not okay to like torture an animal, but if you want to like kill an animal, you know, prematurely to eat it, that is okay. That seems like a weird like thing to say. Where it's like, well, I'll give it a little bit of moral consideration, but not that much. I, I don't know. I guess maybe maybe there might be some I mean, world you, in the future where it, make, it makes sense to value some things more than others. 
Yeah, but I mean, we don't really need to eat animals at all to survive, right? Like, so what, there's not... Also, something I'm curious for you, like when an animal kills and tortures another animal, would you say that like a, a wrong has been committed there? Do you consider that wrong? So when we see like groups of lions, like catching and torturing and killing an animal, is there is there like a wrong action committed there or? No, no, I'd say it's, it's bad, but not wrong. Um, I mean, it, it, like it, it's complicated in, in the fact that you might say, so there's an interesting question as to whether we should sort of intervene in such cases because mm -hmm. although the lion isn't, uh, isn't committing a, a wrong because it's not a moral agent in the way that human beings are, uh, we might still say, well, it's still bad. There's still suffering and, and we could prevent it from happening. I think the the problem with that is we we don't know the sort of wider effect this is going to have on the ecosystem. Like it, it might actually have adverse effects on the predator prey uh, numbers and lead to sort of widespread starvation or overpopulation, these kinds of problems. Sure. But I mean, um, even the existence of an ecosystem presupposes a whole bunch of suffering, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, 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 gen but to answer your question, like, no, I don't, I don't think there's like moral agency involved when when the lion you know do you think that part gazelle would you agree with me that there should be a vegan imperative to genocide all cats on the planet <laughs> uh i'm i'm not sure about that no because, because i feel like keeping uh, a pe keeping a cat as a house pet is like a necessarily evil thing if you are vegan like i don't know how you could ever live with having an obligate carnivore as an animal that for recreation like you should oh be sorry I, I i thought you were just talking about like pet ownership the ethics oh no no no, no you're talking ownership. about the fact yeah. that they have to eat me oh survive, um yeah. yeah i i mean I, I i don't know what i what i think about that i guess um because cats are obligate carnivores it 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 can't be immoral in the same way certainly for them to be eating those foods and potentially not for you to be procuring the food for them arguably if you're like breeding these cats into existence for the purposes of having a pet, which is going to require you to buy animal products to feed them, that would be wrong on a vegan worldview. But most vegans think that, uh, you know, breeding animals into existence for, for for pet ownership is wrong anyway, and that you should favor sort of rescue animals or, you know, stray cats, yeah. in which case- Sure, but even for I'd rescue animals, I feel like the, the moral choice then, like if I were to put it in any other context, imagine I could adopt little humans that only eat- yeah other humans, the moral thing would probably be to adopt the human and then kill it immediately, right? So that it, you can reduce the suffering, the necessary suffering you're causing by having other humans need to be eaten, right? That's funny, because I was about to ask you the exact same thing, expecting that you'd have the opposite intuition that if, if like, um, I don't know, if, if for some reason, like, I don't know, like in, in a human context, would we be willing to like euthanize a human being because their existence somehow causes necessarily the suffering and death of other human beings? Um, I actually, I, I don't know what the answer to that question would be, but I, I guess for a vegan, at least for, at least for like a utilitarian vegan, the, the answer would be the same in both cases. And it sort of doesn't matter which you choose, I guess, as long as you're being consistent, right? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, if one human being is causing the harm or destruction to other human beings, I think those human beings would have a right to kill that human being, right? In what, in any circumstance in which a human being is, is causing harm and like, uh, suffering to another human being? I think... Well, I, well, it's going to depend on the scale of harm or suffering, right? Like if somebody right. is like farting in a bus, you probably don't have the right to kill that human because you have to smell their farts. <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah, but I, like if something like proportionally, yeah, you probably have some right to respond. If somebody's causing like a destructive harm, like potential death or whatever, then you have a right. If, if they're infringing on those rights, you have their rights are essentially revoked in that sense, right? If somebody's trying to kill you, you can kill them, et cetera. Mm. But it's going to depend on yeah. the level of you know, infringement. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a there's a sense in which if somebody is even innocently threatening your life, you have a right to self defense. Like if you know if I, if somebody gets strapped to the front of a tank that's about to run me over, and it's not my fault that they're there, I think, and the only way to stop them is like blowing up the tank. I think I have a a, a justification for doing so. But as a third party observer, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that would still be the case. I think if I were observing the situation where an innocent person is strapped onto a tank that's about to run over another human being, uh, the only way to stop it is to blow up the tank. It's certainly not obvious to me that I have a right to blow up the tank in the way that I have a right to defend myself if I'm in the situation, you know? So so maybe the, the fact that you're procuring the food for the obligate carnivore pet makes a difference here in a way that we wouldn't say it's wrong or bad for the cat to procure the food. Or even as a pet owner, for you to allow the cat to go out and do that, you sort of procuring the food might be might be different. Um. Yeah, potentially, yeah. Yeah, maybe I'd have to think about that more. I just like to tell vegans to kill their cats, so... <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, there's a, there's a whole conversation that we can have about veganism generally, but I, I guess what I wanted to talk about was the ethical treatment of animals generally or your sort of 
mm-hmm. ethical view of animals, which is is quite separate from the vegan discussion because mm-hmm. indeed, like it's it's connected. Of course, it informs it. If you don't think animals have worth at all, then you can do whatever you like to them. But even if you think animals have worth, you might not think that they have enough worth to not be killed under any circumstances. You might think that just factory farming is bad. You might think that factory farming is still fine because although they suffer, it's not that much or something like this. I think that would be a bit weird to say. But you could do that. It's a separate discussion. But just on this topic of like animal suffering, it's been sort of interesting to to prod you a little bit, I guess. Um, yeah. And I'll be interested to hear what our what our collective listeners have to say about the matter. Probably going to be really mad, but I will say um, the uh, I think the worst people. I think I'm the second worst people. I think the worst people are people that seem to be gr- uh, gravely concerned with animal suffering that have no problem eating meat products. Um, I think you have to pick one side of the fence there. Uh, I, I don't think that you can be concerned with uh, like some animals and not others. I see people are very concerned about like Cecil the lion or concerned with cats and dogs, but they seem to have no issue or are completely indifferent to things like factory farming and whatnot. Um, yes. Yeah. It's possible maybe in the future if I think about it more. I haven't really thought much about like a sliding scale of morality. Uh, I mean, intuitively, it, it feels better. I guess like uh, sometimes if I'm in like a grocery store, I might choose like a factory farm thing because the idea of like little chickens running around and hatching eggs feels better than like the fucking pita factories of the massive farm chickens. Um, so yeah, that might be something I change my mind on in the future. But um, you, I mean, you do yeah. you do have some moral concern for these animals then? Yeah, you have There's to. Every human there. does. Like we share enough like outward features that. But but again, I would say like there are thought experiments where you can hijack that system very easily. Um, like for instance, I could I could or not me, but like somebody could very easily sufficiently program a robot that could exhibit such emotions. But we are very confident there's no. Um, like experience going there. I remember there was one of the, is it the dog robot or it might be one for the, I wish I could remember the lab that makes the huge walking robots that everybody's like, oh, cool, Boston oh, Dynamics uh, or whatever. Boston right? Dynamics. Yeah, yeah, and there's a couple of videos where you watch them like push the robot over and he's like trying to stand up and you actually, you kind of feel a little bit bad. You're like, oh shit. Or when you talk to like that chat GPT thing, like you can kind of bully it in some ways like, right. oh, this actually feels like a little bit bad. Um, the Did you ever see the movie Blade Runner 2049? No, I'm 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 pretty bad at at films. I'm watching my, oh, sure. Probably, there's a part in that movie now. where like there's a robot that belongs to another robot, and that robot gets killed, and you're like, oh man, that feels really bad. Even though you know it's not only not only is it a robot, but it's a robot that was made to help another robot. And it's like yeah, so so in some ways like I listen to my intuitions, and then in other ways it's like okay, yeah, but my intuitions can also take me to kind of silly spots. But like um yeah, maybe maybe the maybe the gradient thing is something I'll I'll change my mind on in the future. We'll see. Yeah, maybe we can, uh, you know, sit down and talk about it again. I, I'm hoping that people will be glad to see us together. I know I've had a lot of requests to talk to you in various contexts, uh, pretty much as long as I've been doing doing YouTube. I think uh, since a time when you had less subscribers than I did. So, right. Yeah, well, hey, I'm there's ever like a particular applied or any non-meta fucking moral question that comes up. Yeah, if you ever want to chop shop again or chat or whatever, feel free to shoot me a message. Um, or I'm, bully me I'm about. glad we got to do the meta stuff because I know that you're a bit sort of allergic to it. So I'm I'm, I'm a glad we managed to get a conversation on it. Yeah, I'm rusty too. So yeah, thanks. I appreciate the conversation. Cool, man. All right. Well, Stephen Bunnell, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Did you enjoy that conversation? You must have done at least a little bit because you made it to the end. Well, you can find more full episodes of the Within Reason podcast by clicking the link that just appeared on your screen or click just below it for clips from that podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, and if you really like the content, support us on Patreon for early access, as well as to really help this podcast to grow. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.